the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences has today decided to award the 2020 Nobel Prize in Physics with one half to Roger Penrose for the discovery that black hole formation is a robust prediction of the general theory of relativity. Hello, everybody. Welcome to this special online event honoring Roger Penrose on the occasions of his 90th birthday and Nobel Prize. We have viewers from 70 countries who are uh, joining uh, as we speak. And uh, welcome. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's great honor to be involved with this. I want to thank, first of all, the people who made that very wonderful video, Sasha Seifert of Muna Films in Stuttgart. Uh, I want to thank Abby Behar Montefiore, the Assistant Director of the Center for Consciousness Studies, and uh, Manny Baumick and Alvin Clark Foundation for sponsoring us, the Lowe's Ventana Canyon Resort for hosting us here and the host of our uh, Tucson conferences, and finally, uh, Matt George and his crew from Commotion Studios. I'm Stuart Hameroff, Director of the Center for Consciousness Studies, who, is, uh, who are putting on this, uh, this program. Uh, Roger Penrose almost needs no introduction. His achievements in science, math, and philosophy cover a wide range, uh, an eclectic mix of topics, which we've narrowed down to four areas for this event, one each day. Uh, there were some other things we, we had to skip over. Um, on a personal note, I have to say that it has been my personal honor and pleasure to know and collaborate with Roger for almost 30 years. Hard to believe. Let me say he is as nice a person as he is a brilliant scientist. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Sir Roger Penrose. Well, <clears throat> thank you, Stuart, for that flattering introduction. Um, I hope this works. In fact, I hope you can see my slide. Um, <clears throat> it has to do with consciousness, quantum state reduction, black holes, and conformal cyclic cosmology, which are the topics that Stuart mentioned. I may sneak in one or two in the post, in, in my, one or two others in the procedure. 
Anyway, let me proceed with my talk, which I hope you can hear. Uh, I want to start by mentioning some influences on me when I was a graduate student in Cambridge, came, that's Cambridge, England, and I was studying algebraic geometry. I was supposed to be, that was my research topic. And I thought I would go to various lectures. I thought it was lots of time, three years seemed like a long time. I thought I'd go to various other lectures, which interested me in a sort of outside way. Turned out they influenced me more probably than the lectures I was supposed to be going to with regard to my topic. The first one of these lectures I've listed here is one by Steen on mathematical logic. The second one was by Bondi on general relativity and the third on the great Paul Dirac on quantum mechanics. Let me start by saying something about the mathematical logic. First of all, the thing that I remember learning <clears throat> I, before going to these lectures, I had, when I was an undergraduate, many talks with Ian Percival, who was um, studying maths at the same time as I was. He also went to become a fellow of the Royal Society. But we had discussed discussions on wide topics, and we talked about Gödel's theorem. I had no idea what it was. It seemed to prove something, say that there were things in mathematics that you couldn't prove. I didn't like the idea of that. Uh, so I, when I went to Steen's lectures, I learned about, well, I learned about Turing machines, the idea of com computability, as well as Gödel's theorem. And let me describe what Gödel's theorem really says. It wasn't at all what I was afraid it would say, that there were things in maths you couldn't prove. <clears throat> Depends what you mean by prove, you see. If you have a system of rules, which I'm calling R, and I'm adopting the Turing point of view here, that we're just looking at computability, a set, set of rules which you could put on a computer, which um, well, if you feed it with the proposition R, that's meant to be some mathematical proposition, then it will say, maybe it'll say, yes, it's true, because it can be proved by means of the rules you've given me. Or it will be say, no, it's false, because it can be shown to be false by the rules you've given me. Or it may just not give an answer. It may go on forever and just chug away without giving you any answer. Okay, now suppose it's the case that you constructed the rules in such a way that whenever it says yes, you believe it's true. That's the key point. Do you believe that the rules, the mathematical rules of procedure, the, the logical, whatever the rules are, that if you follow them and it says, yes, it's true, then it really is true. You believe it's true by virtue of understanding what the rules mean and that they do give you truths. Here was the stunning thing. Gödel shows a proposition, which I'm calling G of R, which has the property. You look at it carefully, you see how it's constructed, and you can see that it is true by virtue of your trust in the rules R. But on the other hand, it cannot be proved using the rules of R. Now, I found this absolutely stunning. It shows that by our understanding of what the rules mean, and that you try your trust in those rules, that trust or belief, if you like, your understanding, enables you to transcend the rules themselves. So it really struck me that human understanding, whatever it is, is something which is not constrained by rules. Now there's a catch to this, of course, and the catch mainly, people always point out, is that how do you know what the rules are? You might have inside your head somewhere, some rules that always give you the right answer, but you don't know what they are. It seems to me pretty implausible, but still, that's a, a way of wriggling out of the Gödel theorem. I should point out that it's uh, equivalent to Turing computability. Gödel was mainly thinking about, um, uh, he, he was thinking about <clears throat> um, following logical systems and all that, but Turing was really phrasing it in a more general way in terms of computability. And there's a thing called a universal Turing machine, which you can feed any algorithm into it. But you have to have a, a tape, you see, which tells you what the algorithm is. And here I show there is something, whereas the, the universal machine, it's, this little thing in the middle is quite finite, and you can even write it down. You have to have potentially an infinite 
to, well, it's, he, the way he phrased it in terms of tape, you see, it wouldn't be on the tape these days, of course, these were electronic means. But this picture is just illustrating that it's potentially infinite. You can always call upon more. If you feel you've run out of tape, you can always call upon some more. And that's the rule of the game. The, finite, the machine is finite, but it has a potential to call upon an infinite scribbling space, if you like. That's the way of looking at it. OK, let's move on. Now, let's give a particular way of proving things about the infinite. When I'm talking about the infinite here, I'm talking about natural numbers n equals 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, including 0 as a natural number, 1, 2, 3, 4, etc., the, the non-negative whole numbers. And there is this well-known way of proving something is true of all natural numbers, which is called, um, well, first-order piano arithmetic, or mathematical induction is really the way we learn it. If you want to prove that P of n, a proper, proposition that depends on n, is true for all n, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, etc., etc., First of all, you prove it's true for zero, or you could start with one if you prefer that. But let's start for zero, start with zero. First of all, you prove it's true for zero, and then if it's true for n, then it's true for n plus one. So you do two things, two finite things. And if you can do those two finite things, you show it's true for all n. It's rather amazing that you can prove something is true for all n just by just showing two things. Anyway, that's well known. We learned this sort of thing at school. Um, now, here's an example. I, I was learned about this uh, several years ago. It's a very nice example called um, Goodstein's theorem. And I want to describe it briefly because it illustrates something important here. It's a, something that applies to any natural number. So let's take a natural number as an example. I'm taking 1077. First step is to write it in binary. So these are the I, I've got these, uh, I don't know if I can make my mouse here, here we go. The, the, this is noughts and ones, the binary representation. What does that mean? What's the sum of distinct powers of two? So I've written them here, the distinct powers of two. Now you look at the, the powers, you see, well, they're not written that way. So let's write the powers, all as distinct powers of two in the same way. And then you might say, well, there's a still power there, which is a power of a power. And that has to be written as distinct powers of two. And you go on, and this comes to an end somewhere. Here it's, it's stopped at the third step here. Now, I'm going to apply two rules to this. One, rule number A, rule A, is to replace all the twos by threes. So we go up by, two, all the twos in the expression go up to threes. The number has increased enormously. Never mind, that's rule A. Rule B is subtract one. So it comes down a little bit. Rule A again, replace all the threes by fours will be subtract one. Well, you see, the first time there was a handy one at the end, so subtracting one didn't cause any problem. But secondly, uh, subtracting one, it's a bit like subtracting one from a thousand and getting 999, you know how to do that. It's the same thing with any base, if it was four. You have these coefficients, threes, well, like the nines when you have 999. So it has to be smaller than the base, which is four. And then you do rule A again, which is replacing all the fours by fives and then you can subtract one and you keep on going. The numbers get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, absolutely enormously huge, until they finally reach zero. That's Goodstein's theorem. It's rather remarkable. It's not so hard to prove when you know something. You have to know something which is beyond. The, you see that I've got at the bottom here. It was proved by, by um, Conway and, and sorry, Paris and, and who was that? Kirby, Paris and Kirby, that's right. Proved by Paris and Kirby that there is no way of proving the Goodstein theorem using induction. So if you have ordinary induction, you can't prove this thing, yet it is true. It's a good example to try, first of all, three, start with three, goes up a bit, comes shooting down quite quickly. Then try it with four. I would not recommend putting it on your laptop or putting it on your mainframe or anything on a computer. I would recommend taking a good block of paper and scribbling away and convincing yourself it will eventually come down. It reaches some enormous number, even with four. Okay, now the point here is the, the uh, paris kirby theorem that there is no way of proving this using ordinary induction, yet it's not impossible to see it's true. 
you can see it's true, certainly with, with an example like this, just playing around for a bit, you're just gonna see it can come down again. The general proof depends on something called transfinite induction, which was an innovation due to Cantor. But the point here is you don't have to have the genius of Cantor to follow the argument. Once you've seen the argument, you can follow it. So you can see it's true. Now, the point I'm trying to make here is if it's an algorithm in our head, which decides what it, whether a thing in mathematics is true or not, how did it evolve by natural selection? You could sort of imagine how possibly ordinary induction could have evolved by natural selection. But how something which enables you to prove Goodstein's theorem could, improve, could evolve by natural selection, some algorithm which it doesn't, doesn't, doesn't make any sense at all. And here I have this cartoon with in the background, you see things that we were naturally selected for. I'm talking about the human race, such as um, capturing animals, so domesticating animals, growing crops, building shelters. On the left-hand side, you see making a mammoth trap. That was this wonderful idea that somebody seems to have had. And here we have in the foreground, a mathematician struggling away with it. There's a little bit of joke about the theorem. I won't mention that. Um, he is struggling to prove some mathematical theorem, oblivious of the fact that he's just about to be devoured by a saber-toothed tiger. Well, the moral of this is that it's not a selective advantage to be a mathematician. It, and I think that's probably still true. Now, it's, uh, it's a selective advantage, clearly, to use your understanding in all sorts of ways. It's the same understanding in perhaps a more refined way, in some sense, that you use to prove mathematical theorems. But there's, it's just showing that it can't be an algorithm which was developed by, by natural selection, because how could anybody prove that Goodstein's theorem is true, for example? And, and it, as I say, once you grasp the idea, you can go and look at what Cantor's argument, if you like. Once you grasp the idea, you see it does eventually come down to zero. But anything which could have been part of our history in natural selection, that any algorithm, that is to say, just doesn't make any sense. However, the general concept of understanding, whatever that is, could well have done. And you see, understanding, I'm trying to argue, is something which requires consciousness. Here I have an example. I like to have examples of things where you can, sh you can show examples of things which are non-computable. So what I'm trying to say is that human understanding, whatever it is, is not a computable thing. And an example of something which is non-computable is if you've got a set of polyominoes, and I have, have an example of three of them. Polyominoes are shapes made out of equal squares glued together in a, in a plane. And you make, say, a collection, a finite collection of different polyominoes. And the question is, can you use those to cover the plane without any gaps or overlaps, the entire plane? And this is not, there's no algorithmic solution to this problem. That is to say, generally, you cannot decide by any algorithm, this is the theorem basically due to, to um, well, Raphael Robinson, no, it wasn't, this was, oh yeah, I'm gonna forget my names, just right on the spot. Let me not worry about that. But anyway, it was, um, it certainly is a theorem that you, that you, there is. It depends on things like this particular example, which I made up. This example of these three particular polyominoes will tile the plane but it will tile the plane only in a way which never repeats itself. It's a good example to try and see if you can do it, or whether you can get in computer even to get this far, it would be very intriguing to see. I have another example, which I also made up a bit later, which I'll show you. This is an example where you have um, three different shapes. One of them is a regular dodecagon, and then you have a regular hexagon and a square, and you have to cover the entire plane matching the arcs. Um, you have to use one dodecagon, that's a rule. You can, you can force that also with a jigsaw arrangement, that, but that's not the point. Now you see the general scheme will be it's something like this kind of pattern where your dodecagons fit inside squares and hexagons in that way. But which way around they are is a, a matter of how do you know? And uh, it's another example which, it, well, I, I'll show you in the next slide, you can see Here's a nice picture which shows how far you get. <laughs> it never repeats itself. It, all, it keeps almost repeating itself. It would be most intriguing 
if you simply put that on a computer as a problem, you see, fill those, each, each one of those dodecagons, is, you have to fit it somewhere around and the computer tries one after the other, different ways of arranging it. And then you have to make sure that you could fill, fill it in with the squares and the, and the hexagons. And if you can do it, that works. And can you cover the whole plane? Well, there is an algorithm. The algorithm is to find, go through my collected works. In one of my papers, it explains how you can do it. Oh, I'm so sorry, that, that was the, the one I gave you before. <laughs> this one I'm not sure is in any of my papers. Never mind. Yeah, the, it's, it's there somewhere, I think. Anyway, the way you do it uh, is do, involves, um, again, it's some sort of hierarchical scheme. And, and I should say the pattern I just showed you here was, I gave a talk on that. And uh, Joshua Sokolar, who was in the audience, had a computer program which we could modify to produce this pattern. So it was produced by a computer, but the computer had to know what to do. So he had to tell the computer what to do, knowing the basis on which this was constructed. I just wanted to show you that even starting from very simple ingredients like the ones we have here, these three shapes, fitting them together, making sure you have one dodecagon, um, the only way you can do it is in a very, very complicated pattern. And I would be very intrigued to see how far you can get just by trial and error with a computer. I should say there are, I think, I think something like 2,000 of the dodecagons in this pattern. I, I roughly estimated that just a short while ago, something like 2,000 of them. And if each one has 12 different ways of organizing itself, well, you can see how many there are different ways to try. You might try pattern recognition. I doubt that it gets very far. It'd be most intriguing to see how well a, a computer would get with this. Anyway, that's beside the point in a way. More or less what I'm trying to say is that our understanding is something which is simply not governed by an algorithm. If it's not governed by an algorithm, then what can it be governed by? Well, here I have to move on to the, the other topics here. And I want to talk about um, ge general relativity and quantum mechanics, because the view I have is that although we have a wonderful theory of general relativity, which tells us how gravitating bodies behave, and we have another wonderful theory of quantum mechanics, both the product of 20th century physics thinking, and when you bring them together, there are going to be some issues. You see, basically, general relativity is something you could put on a computer. As we now know, particularly seen with, uh, say, LIGO, which can work out the shapes of, of black holes swallowing each other and things like that, what kind of a gravitational wave signal you would get. And then you can, you can test to see what, whether you see these in, in, in in the gravitational wave signals. So you can certainly, I mean, there is a problem about the continuum. You see, these theories depend on the continuum and you've got to make sure that good enough approximation is good enough. So there are issues there which are relevant. I never thought they were the key issues and I still don't think they're the key issues. The key issue is in my view, something completely different. What I'm trying to say here is you could put general relativity on a computer. What about quantum mechanics? Well, yes. But there is a question here that I want to raise, which is what happens when you try to combine general relativity with quantum mechanics. And there are the two basic principles of each theory, which I'm arguing are in conflict with each other. The first is the principle of equivalence, which is the, well, Galileo principle. You might imagine that Galileo was dropping a big rock and a little rock from the leading tower. He may well not have ever done it, but he certainly postulated that you could, and he knew very well that air resistance would interfere with it, but he argued that if there were no air resistance, if you dropped a big rock and a little rock together, they would simply fall together, and a little insect looking on one, or sitting on one rock looking at the other, would look as though gravity had been cancelled out. So basically you can cancel out gravity locally by falling freely with it. And here we have a sort of 2001 type space station and astronaut, and even though the Earth is right there, falling freely in orbit, the astronaut does not feel the gravitational field, at least not the first order. Certainly, if you, deviations from uniformity could be felt, but not the gravitational, direct gravitational field itself. That's the principle of equivalence. 
and the fundamental principle of quantum mechanics that I'm going to refer to here is the principle of superposition. I should mention that in Dirac's lecture, I think it was the first lecture he gave, he was talking about the superposition principle. He said uh, an atom can be over here, can have a state where it's over here, or can have a state where it's over there. Then you have all kinds of states where it's over here and over there at the same time. And then he took out his piece of chalk. Now at this point, I was, my mind was sort of wandering. I was looking out of the window, thinking about something completely different. But I gather he was thinking about a piece of chalk and whether this piece of chalk could be in the superposition of two places. He sort of represented this by breaking it in two. So I'm told I was not paying attention, so I don't even remember that. All I remember is that when my attention came back to his lecture, he'd moved on to the next topic. So I assumed he had some explanation for why pieces of chalk could not be in a superposition, or at least you don't tend to find them in a superposition of two different locations at once. I puzzled over that ever since. And perhaps it's a good thing I didn't hear his explanation. It was probably some way to convince one not to worry about this problem. And I don't quite know what it was, something about too much energy. I think I remembered him saying something like that. I didn't quite see what that had to do with it. But here is where it led me eventually. I'm now imagining that I have a, a quantum experiment on the tabletop. So at the top right, we see a tabletop and I imagine there is some experiment being performed on that to do with a quantum experiment. I knew what you do is a standard procedures in quantum mechanics, you have a wave function and you evolve this wave function according to the Schrodinger equation. And that's perfectly good. And you tell what the evolution of the system is according to quantum mechanics. Now let's suppose that we want to consider the Earth's gravitational field as well. So we're going to say as part of the system, you've got the Earth's gravitational field, which I suppose we'll suppose is a uniform field. And then here, there are two ways you might consider doing the problem. First is the way any standard oh, sane physicist would do it, would simply to do, use the green coordinates, which are fixed in the table, the frame of reference of the table. You put in a term into the Hamiltonian to represent the gravitational force, and you just chug away as any sane physicist would do it. But if you were, if you notice Einstein sitting in the corner, you say, whoops, no, I should be doing it your way. No, you imagine that if you fell freely, there would be no gravitational field. So you imagine doing it all over. These are the purple coordinates now. And now there is no gravitational field. You have to transform from one to the other and you should get the same answer. Well, you sort of get the same answer. You get the same answer except for phase factor. The purple psi, that is the wave function for the Einsteinian view. The green one is the one for the Newtonian view, if you like, you disregard gravity as another force. The thing is this phase factor. Now you might say phase factor doesn't make any difference in quantum mechanics, because when you work out probabilities, you take squared moduli and the phase factor just cancels out. However, you look a little bit more carefully at the phase factor and you see there's a T cubed in it. What that tells you, and I'm talking to the experts now, quantum field theory and things like that. What I'm saying is that you, the green and purple your systems are really with different vacuum states. You're doing quant different quantum field theories. It shouldn't matter, actually. You chug with, along with one quantum field theory or the other, and you get the same answers. Who cares? OK, now I'm going to change the problem a little bit. In fact, really rather seriously. I'm considering that not just having the Earth's field, in part of this experiment, I have a, a massive body, and this massive body is put into a superposition of two places at once. So at the bottom of the picture, I'm imagining it's in its blue location, superposed with being in its brown location. Now, any point in this picture, you see the gravitational field involves a superposition, and that means you'd have to look at your wave function. If you did it the Einsteinian way, you'd be in trouble because you have to, you've got the acceleration coming in and you really have to um, think about it. The Newtonian way, you're not in trouble because you don't have that phase factor and you just chug away. But I'm saying the Einsteinian way is more correct. We know now that Einstein's theory is extremely accurately um, tested in all sorts of ways, even when gravitational fields are present. So that we, in fact, the LIGO depends upon very subtle quantum effects to make sure that you, you, you see the gravitational waves coming and so on and all sorts of other experiments. But what we don't see yet is any example where you have a superposition of two gravitational fields. 
this is a theoretical discussion then. And the, what I do here is to say, well, I don't know how to do it because the phase factor is varying as we go over the phase. What I'm going to do is to say, well, I'm going to cheat a bit and measure the, the, um, how much the, the cheat is. So you, basically you, you, you pretend that it, it's, that this gravitational discrepancy is not there and you, and you work out the energy over the whole thing. I won't go into the details here. It's a bit of a calculation. And you come up with a formula for an energy which is an uncertainty in the energy, which is a measure of the cheat. So the cheat you're doing is an approximation. And there is something not quite right, but in order to use the Einsteinian view over the whole system, you have to do something like that. You sort of average it out in a sense. Now this is an uncertainty. You can, you can relate this to an uncertainty in the energy of the system. This uncertainty is what I'm calling E sub G. EG is the energy uncertainty in the system. And then I use the Heisenberg um, time energy uncertainty, which tells you that if you have an energy uncertainty, then you have a time uncertainty. And you pretend it's like a, a, an unstable nucleus. An unstable nucleus, the, the lifetime of this nucleus is inversely related to an energy uncertainty. And I'm just using that point of view in reverse. It's a bit like uh, an unstable particle, that is, it goes to one or to the other in a time scale, which can be calculated from this formula. And it comes from this, this calculation. Now, I'm not asking people to, I haven't even given it to you in detail, but I'm, but I'm just saying that this is a justification for a discrepancy between the two theories. You can quantify that and identify that with a lifetime in a system where you have a superposition between two masses. I should say that this EG can be uh, described in the following way. You imagine that that lump, let me go back to this picture we just had. Imagine the lump was not superposed and then you move them from, from being superposed to the, the brown and the, the blue in superposition. And then you pretend that you're looking at the energy it would cost to separate them just from the gravitational attraction between the two. Another way of looking at it is to say, work out the gravitational self-energy of the difference between the two mass distributions. You take the blue one distribution, subtract the brown one, and work out the gravitational self-energy of that distribution. That's another way of saying the same thing, as long as it's a rigid displacement, which it is here. And that gives you this quantity, e.g. Now, it happens that Diyoshi, some years, well, it was a year or two, certainly a while before I did it, using quite different rationale, um, not using the principle of equivalence idea, or, uh, but it just came to the same formula. So it's sometimes referred to as the Diyoshi Penrose criterion. I want to emphasize, however, that our points of view are very different. And I want to stress the, the way in which it's different. So let me, I can't quite remember what uh, order I put my slides in. Yes, I'm coming to the next point. The point was, as I say, right from the start, I was saying, how is it that a conscious being can do things which are not algorithmic? And the loophole to the argument is, in my view, it can't be general relativity, relativity. it can't be following the Schrodinger equation, it's got to be in the collapse of the wave function. Because the collapse of the wave function is not something where you arrive at it from evolving the Schrodinger equation. You see, when I say the collapse of the wave function, this is, this is the way quantum mechanics works. You evolve a system according to the Schrodinger equation, and then you come up with some superposition, and then you, quote, make a measurement on it. Well, what's making a measurement? Well, you wheel in that piece of apparatus. That piece of apparatus does its making of a measurement, there may be a little dial on the thing, and the dial says yes or no. It says it's, this thing has happened or it's not happened. Something or other, which is making the system bigger. The system is now bigger. It involves maybe mass displacement, even if it's just a little needle moving one way or the other. There is a displacement of material at some point. And when that happens, I argue that you are in, in trouble. And that it's like an unstable particle. There is a mass uncertainty. 
like an unstable particle, it goes one way or it goes the other way. Now, <clears throat> um, and the times, the average time scale is measured by the reciprocal of this, e.g. So that's the idea. Um, but it's not the Schrodinger equation, because if it were, you would say, what happens to the apparatus? Well, the apparatus is in the superposition of seeing one thing or other. Or, of course, famous cat, Schrodinger was well aware of this problem, of course. He emphasized it with his famous cat. That is to say, you have some system where a quantum effect decides whether the cat is killed or not killed. And then the cat is, if you simply follow his equation, the cat is deemed to be in a superposition of being alive or dead. And then the argument goes, somebody opens the box, and as soon as they look in at the cat, the cat becomes alive or dead. Well, what about the consciousness of the cat? Is it really a consciousness of anything? I could never make sense of that view, although very distinguished physicists certainly contemplated it, including Eugene Wigner. I certainly discussed this issue with him. Yeah, I think he wasn't dedicated to that view. He certainly was playing with the idea, and John von Neumann and other people. Um, I never could quite make sense of it. I could have imagined particularly there was a distant planet and on that distant planet, there is no life. It's, a, it's a, a, an Earth-like planet, but there is no life. It has an atmosphere. And as we come to believe, the nature of the atmosphere depends on the butterfly effect. There's a tiny effect, but there are no butterflies on this planet. So there's nothing to decide could be a quantum thing, it could be one or the other, and these superpositions are maintained into the atmosphere. So rather than being a thunderstorm or a rainstorm or snowing or a last, nice sunny day or whatever it is, all these things are in superposition. Okay, it's, maybe it's say four light years away, Proxima Centauri or something, and there is this rocket ship going to take a photograph. It's gonna take maybe 10 years, it's a very fast rocket ship. Takes 10 years takes a photograph and another four years before the photograph comes back to Earth. The photograph is a superposition of one weather or another. Somebody sitting on the Earth is looking at the television screen and finally the signal comes through and what does he see? A superposition of one, uh, one, planet, one weather or another? No, he sees one weather or the other. So does this go back all the way back to the, to the space probe and suddenly make it change to one or the other. It makes no sense to me. So I certainly don't believe that view. I think it's the sort of blue view, maybe it's worth believing at some stage in your life, but it seems to me it doesn't make sense. There's got to be something objective in what happens in the reduction of the state or the collapse of the wave function, or that is to say the cat becoming live or dead, which in my view and probably in Schrodinger's would have happened well, well before anything like that any disturbance in the atmosphere or something, and one or the other would have happened. And I was gratified to believe that not only Einstein, also Schrodinger had a view that quantum mechanics was not a complete theory and that something had to resolve this problem. I was even more gratified to hear that Dirac, although he didn't mention it in his lectures, held a similar view. You have to find the right quote, but Dirac certainly also had the view that quantum mechanics was a provisional theory, and that one needs to have something which resolves the measurement issue. And my view is that it has to be something like the displacement of material, and this criterion of when the collapse happens is the sort of thing I'm suggesting. Now, as I was saying, this has to be doing something to do with consciousness. So conscious understanding had to depend, according to this view, on the collapse of the wave function. Outrageous. Well, I wrote my book, the Emperor's, of the, the Emperor's New Mind, to try and understand how this could happen. I learned a bit about neurophysiology. I learned about nerve transmission. And learning about nerve transmission, I really there's no chance. The transmission of a signal down a nerve is going to disturb the electric fields or go right through into the brain, and they're simply decohere in no time flat. So I just had no idea. Anyway, it didn't stop me writing a book, I suppose, which was a good thing. I sort of went off into a little tangent and asked the question. Fortunately, Stuart Hammeroff read my book and wrote to me and says, evidently you don't know, know about these little things, which I'm showing a picture of here, microtubule. He had, they're all over the place, particularly inhabit nerve cells. And he took the view 
they were what were interfered by with by um, general anesthetics. So his very important point that as a probe of consciousness, finding out what it is exactly that turns consciousness off. It seemed to me that was a really important angle on the whole subject. People kind of say, well, how do you ever measure it? When you measure it, it's certainly not one way you can measure it because you can turn it off. In what way does it turn it off? What turns it off? What, does it, what the, the gases, the anesthetic gases, what do they affect? What materials do they affect? What things in the brain does it affect to turn them off? And his idea was it's macrotubules. Of course, the subject has moved enormously since then, and we'll hear all about these things and later on in this conference. But this was the sort of thing view he had at that time, that you could have this alpha and beta part of the tubulin, and that they could be in two different uh, possible uh, conformations. Um, I don't know that that's the view now, but, but that certainly was very exciting to me that you could have things in the brain which maybe the disturbance of, of mass movement could affect this motion. There was another thing I mentioned in my book, which I have come to here. I'm jumping around a bit, but I think it's an important fact. This was something I learned from Eric Hart's book on uh, experiments due to Benjamin Libet. And I just want to refer to this one in particular because it's a very intriguing experiment. Um, where in this experiment, a, a patient has a, a, a brain operation for another reason. I'm not sure we'd be allowed to do these things anymore, but for some other reason. And the patient had permitted Libet to do these experiments while the brain was exposed. And what Libet was doing was stimulating the finger with a certain probe um, and also stimulating the same part of the brain, which is to do with the sensory perception of the stimulation of that same part of the finger. And in these diagrams, we see time going from left to right, and the abrupt signal is, is the, um, the stimulation of the finger, I think, and then the other one is stimulating the brain. And the main point I want to point out is the one, um, think four down, I think, where this finger, the finger is stimulated first. Well, first of all, let's go to the top. If you stimulate the finger, then the patient will claim that by looking at a clock, there is a fast moving clock in the room, and the patient will say, yes, I felt that almost as soon as the hand of the clock was at such a spot. And it's virtually simultaneous. Very, very tiny fraction of a second is claimed that the feeling was, was made by the patient. OK, now what about stimulation by the brain? Now here I have it, if that, you go th three down, there the stimulation by the brain, that's the top signal, goes along. And then the, the feeling by the patient is not till about half a second afterwards. So the patient won't, won't feel a thing until about half a second afterwards. OK, now we'll go one down. Stimulate the finger first, then a quarter of a second later, stimulate the brain. The patient doesn't feel the finger stimulation. It's unfelt. I find that really remarkable. The, the brain stimulation is subsequently felt. Anyway, it, the point is that, that this is making, and somehow swept under the carpet, I think, by many people, is the fact that although the brain stimulation, the finger stimulation seems to be felt almost at once, if you stimulate the brain half a second later, it's unfelt. It's somehow as though it had never been felt. And in fact, in The Emperor's New Mind, I sort of postulated the idea that maybe our sensations are displaced by maybe something like half a second. And we don't really feel it just yet. I couldn't quite make sense of that idea. But I, then I went off into a tangent and suggested all sorts of things, puzzles about what means to feel things and so on. So I, let's not go into that. But I find, regard this experiment as important, and it relates to the view that I, I'm, I'm sort of jumping really ahead here, because <clears throat> this view I didn't come to in detail until very recently, <clears throat> less than a year ago, when I was writing some thoughts. The pandemic allowed me to sort of work these things out, and then the Nobel Prize kind of stopped it again, because I got too many other things going on, I couldn't follow the I have to go back to it, but let me explain this picture. 
And the reason for this picture comes about thinking about two views of reality. I want to explain this first. There's a view of reality which I'm calling classical reality. And classical reality is more or less where macroscopic things are, space time, what it's doing. And it, it, it's, it's our pretty classical view of what we think the world is doing. And classical reality is distinguished in the following way. You can ask of a system, you can say to the system, what is your state? And the system can tell you about why well, my state is such and such. Ah, okay, you can measure it and it'll say, yeah, that's the, yeah. you don't know what the thing is, you can measure it and it says, yeah, okay, that's, that's what I'm doing. Yeah, thank you. Now, quantum reality is very different. It's, it's dependent on things, and some, what I call Einstein's dictum. Einstein had a dictum for what he called an element of reality. And this is what I'm called quantum reality. Now, quantum reality, you confirm, you can, you can take a system and you can evolve the state according to the Schrodinger evolution, if you like, and you can say where you think it's got to. And where you think it's got to is such and such. And what you're allowed to say is you can ask the system, is your state such and such? If you've got it right, the state will say, yes, my state is such and such. If you've got it wrong, the state will maybe say yes, maybe no, with probability. If you've got it almost right, it might say yes, 99% of the times, but no, 1% of the times. If you've got it really spot on, it will say yes, 100% of the times. And that is the Einstein notion of an element of reality. Now, this is what I'm calling quantum reality. And I'm just pointing out that they're very distinct. At the bottom of this picture, I have a laser, which is emitting a photon. There's a beam splitter here. So the state of that photon is split into two. One, the horizontal track, hits a body with enough impact to move it slightly. The other leaves it alone. So since the photon, as it's after beam split, is in two places, two things at once, this means the body is now moving into two places at once. Now, I'm, the time evolution, you see, first of all, this is a picture of the space-time being slightly deformed by the lump being sitting there. As time evolves, we're going up the picture now, you see the lump is now in a slight superposition, slight superposition. So the space-time is in a bit of a superposition, a bit of a superposition, a bit of a superposition until it reaches the EG level. So this is the level at which um, the criterion would tell you there's a good chance. It's not, it's, you see, it's like decay of an of a unstable particle. It's giving you a sort of half-life of when it might become one or the other. So it becomes one or the other. And then it's as though, now, this is where you have to look at how it could be consistent with relativity. Or this, people get shocked by this uh, often. It's as though the superposition was all there in its quantum reality. But once the measurement or the collapse, if you like, happens, it's become one or the other. It's as though the universe had done that all along. So you have to say the classical reality followed that path. The quantum reality was in the superposition. But as soon as that superposition was resolved by being one or the other, the reality of the thing follows the classical reality. Now, that is sort of retroactive in a very curious way, because somehow it's as though this acts backwards. Now, I'm putting this here because although I didn't, wasn't very explicit about this point of view for a long time, I'm not sure I had it. Certainly, it was a few years ago when I first entertained this kind of, about three years ago, I think there was a conference, one of Stuart's conference on consciousness. And I did mention an idea of the sort, but it's very different from the Dioshi idea. So whereas ideas like, like Dioshi's, many others, where you think of the state of the reduction of being something which happens up here, then you see the jump from being a superposition is something which you think of as being like a bit of a heating. You see the state is one state and then jumps to another. It's a bit like it getting hot. And there is a heating which people try to measure in systems and they take things down deep wells and mines and things like that. And they've never yet seen this heating. It's a heating which is broadly predicted by theories where you, you have a more sort of sensible physics idea where the collapse becomes one or the other. 
in a sort of dynamical way. But I'm saying it's not like that. It's retroactive in a certain sense. Now you've got to go into this and can that retroactivity reactivity ever lead you into paradox? I don't think it does, but it does certainly something you've got to look into very carefully. I don't think there's any paradox. But the nearest thing to paradox is the following. If your consciousness is something like this, then that means that you can retroactively, in a sense, affect something. Now I want to go back to Libet's experiments. You see, the idea here is, you see, let's go to the first one again. The, the patient looks at the clock and says, well, no, what I feel is pretty well only slightly after whatever it is, more or less instantaneous with the clock's position. But then you see your consciousness of where that hand is in this view is also delayed. So there is a delay in the perception of the finger and of the clock by the same amount. <clears throat> and so you do feel it's more or less simultaneous. <coughs> However, you see the, the, <clears throat> the brain stimulation well, I mean, it, it, the things you haven't actually felt it yet. So if you go and wreck it, then you've unfelt it because you haven't really felt it yet. So this was the idea that I did toy with in the Emperor's New Mind. And now I'm toying, re-toying with it now and really saying that this is what's happening. I'm most struck, you see, when I see things like, I know I was given a, a free ticket to go to the Royal Box at Wimbledon, which was a great honor, I felt. And I even watched Roger Federer playing against... Uh, uh, I forget another chap, an Italian, I think. The first set, I believe, was sort of ding dong, but then Roger Federer really took off on the last. And you could see, you could see that the, him deciding whether he was going to send the ball cross court or down the line was a last minute decision. And he would do one or the other, and there's no way the opponent could see which one he was going to do. And this was really much, much, you know, nothing like a tenth of a, I mean, almost instantaneous. There's a sort of canonical view that I think that you find amongst neurophysiologists is that all these things are done unconsciously. It's much too fast for consciousness. How could you get a signal, the brain and back again, fast enough to do this? Well, maybe it's done by the cerebellum, maybe it's done by all sorts of other parts which might be even closer. In fact, I was having this conversation with Philip Stamp more recently, and he was talking to me about muscle memory. And I always took a view that, well, muscle memory, that must be a, just a muscles don't mem, but maybe there is something there. Maybe you have things where the, there is a superposition and that superposition has not yet been decided. And then when the conscious decision is made, it retroactively goes to that particular decision. You've got to make sense of it. It's a crazy picture. Can you make sense of it without paradox? Does it really work? But the view I'm trying to hold here is that yes, it does. There is something, these very fast, I used to play ping pong when I was at school and things like that. And, and certainly the decisions you make, are they just, are you fooling yourself that you didn't really make that decision then? It was much later some, somehow, or that you only, or when you think about a pianist playing some very complicated piece of music, then the little finger has to decide which key to hit. Well, that, which key to hit, it could be pre-programmed by then in some sense, but is there any control over the, the sort of mood that is going to be put into the playing, which is controlling what that finger does in some detailed way. I think there would be something consciously controlled, and that conscious control could be making a decision between superpositions which have not yet resolved themselves into one or the other. And that can happen in this retroactive way. Okay, that's the thing that I'll leave it with you. It's certainly uh, a view which make, needs a lot of thinking about. You have to make sure that it doesn't lead you into paradox. I don't think it does. It needs a lot of care. It also needs experimentation. I think there are experiments, things like even like two slit experiments where you could, for example, you, you, you have a two slit experiments and the people used to argue about this thing, well, if you could measure which slit it went through, then you just destroy the interference pattern and things like that. But suppose you don't actually measure it, but you keep that thing somewhere, you have something which entangles with which slit it went through, and it keeps it for a while, and then later on just magnifies into something, or decoheres it, or something, all sorts of things like that. Do they destroy the interference pattern on the screen while the particle is in flight? Things like that. 
does that measurement, if it's after the screen is hit or before the screen is hit, does it make a difference? Things like that. So I think there are experiments that could be done which relate to this point, of, this point of view. And I would really like to see them done. Okay, now I've, that's a long story on that, mainly fitting together all the ideas of the different talks, but now let's go back to quantum mechanics and general relativity and how they may relate to each other. And here I get back to the, well, this is a picture taken from the article which I wrote in, 19, well, I wrote it in, uh, when it was 1964, paper was published in 65, I gave a talk in 1964 at King's College. This was um, my paper on uh, gravitational collapse in space-time singularities. Well, the Nobel Prize, I guess, is referring to this paper. I should be, as a technical point, what the paper showed was that singularities are a, a robust prediction of general relativity. It's not quite right to say that black holes are, but it's either black holes or something much worse, namely naked singularities. And I did toy with the idea that you might have naked singularities, certainly for quite a long time. In fact, it's still unproved, as far as I'm aware, that you can't maybe um, have naked singularities in, gen gen excuse me, in generic gravitational collapses. But I think the general view is, and certainly mine, is that you will get, they're not visible, and they would cause much more problems to be visible. Black holes are much the easy, the more calm, more peaceful, more non-paradoxical route to take. So you have to take them very seriously, as people do now. But there, here I more or less have, showing you the sort of picture we have. It's like the Oppenheimer Snyder dust cloud, which was published in, in 19, just before the war, 1939. And they considered a spherically symmetrical cloud of dust. Dust means no pressure. Spherically symmetrical means that they fall towards the center, nothing to stop them. So clearly the density is going to become infinite in the middle. And the fact that you get a singularity is no shock to the system. But you might expect some complicated thing, which doesn't even start to show itself till much later, where irregularities start to build up. And nothing like this picture, much more complicated in the middle. And what I was showing in this is that if you take seriously the view that, um, well, it was the light, I, I should let me move on a little bit because um, I had this picture in mind uh, much earlier than this when I went to hear a lecture by David Finkelstein. I think this was in, in 19, um, 1948. Sorry, 19, 1958, sorry, 1958. In 1958, and he talked about this collapse and so on, and uh, the fact that you could get through the horizon, which is the point here. So you can see here, the, this column, time is going up the picture and you see the light cones tipping over and this, is, this cylinder here represents the horizon and material falls within the horizon. And uh, your light cones tip over and Finkelstein was showing me this picture basically. I came away thinking, gosh, you get away from this pseudo singularity on the horizon, but you still get this one in the middle. Maybe there's a theorem which shows you can't get away from that singularity in the middle. I had no equipment for trying to prove any such thing. And then I start thinking, what do I know about general relativity that maybe other people don't know? So here's where, where, where Dirac comes in. And I think it was in a little earlier than that in his second course of lectures, on quantum field theory, where he talked about two component spinners. And so I learned about them and that made sense of them. I had a general picture of trying to understand tensors and I couldn't see how spinners fitted into this. Somehow you split an index into two and I couldn't see what that sense that made. The Iraq made it completely clear to me. And also this picture arose. Here we have the celestial sphere on the left. This is a point on the celestial, it's actually the future celestial sphere in this picture. So you're looking at the future light cones. Each point on this represents a light ray through the origin, and the two spinner represents a point on the celestial sphere, in other words, a particular light ray, and a little flag plane, and that little flag plane represents a little tangent vector to this. And if, it's also a spinorial thing. If you go all the way around, it gets to minus itself, you have to go around again to get plus itself. But working on these things, <clears throat> I was able to understand how curvature behaved, and how you nicely split the curvature into the vial and the Ritchie parts. 
And here we see an observer looking back at something and the bar curvature gives distortion and Ritchie part gives you um, no distortion. And here we have a picture of the sun and you imagine looking at the distortion. This is of course the light deflection by the sun. And if you imagine a small circular pattern of stars, this would move outwards in such a way that the distortion, that that's the bending of light by the sun, Einstein's effect, and it, the circular pattern will become elliptical. And this is the barrel curvature along the ray, which is causing this effect. Um, okay, now the thing I found in playing with spinners is that this thing called the vial curvature, complicated object, you have to extract it from the Riemann curvature, which is already quite a complicated object, and you make it trace-free and all sorts of things. It has some complicated symmetries and trace-free conditions. On itself, in itself, it's quite a complicated thing. You write it in two spinners, and it bumps about as simple as possible thing you could have. An object with all four indices completely symmetrical. And I happen to know that being completely symmetrical, you could do very nice things with such, such objects. So let me, um, let me digress a little bit. Now, this is a quick digression on things that we're not going to talk about here, but I just wanted to point out that this was the origin of the thing called twister theory, which is not discussed in this meeting. It was discussed in a meeting last week. A lot of people showing us where twister theory had gone. The idea in twister theory is that you have a light ray, and I want to just indicate one of the motivations behind twister theory. Light ray is represented by a single point, and a point is represented by a Riemann sphere. So you think of all the light rays through a point, and that's a Riemann sphere. So you sort of sort of think, turn your picture upside down. Points are sort of primary in the ordinary view, but here you think of the points as representing light rays, and the, the points are the less elementary things like these things. Now this came about, I just as a quick brief <laughs> digression, I remember I shared a, a, a an office with Engelbert Schucking when I was in Syracuse in 1961, I think it was. And he told me something about a fundamental point about quantum field theory is the splitting of field amplitudes into positive and negative frequencies. Nobody had said this to me before. And so I began to think, well, a nice way of doing that, because I was interested in things that were conformally invariant, again, from Schucking's influence, because he was telling me that Maxwell's equations were conformally invariant. So I played around with these things. And so I wanted a criterion which, rather than splitting things into, into their Fourier components, which isn't conformally invariant, we want a criterion for what you mean by positive and negative frequency. Okay, you take your real line, bend it into a circle. It's a question of whether you can go up into the northern or southern hemisphere. Positive frequency up, negative frequency down. And the driving force behind twisted theory was to try and find a representation of something where it, the real things split the thing into two halves, and that's this is where the twister came from. You can represent, I won't go into the details there, but the points up here and the points down there were represented by these complicated looking congruence of rays. And the other thing about this picture, I should say, is that it's not functions which go part, top or bottom, it's cohomology. Okay, complicated mathematics, which I won't go into, but I just thought I'd lead, lead into a little bit of twister theory here because that was certainly a big part of my thinking at the time. Cohomology, what's that? This is a good example. Something which locally makes sense, globally doesn't. You have to have a freedom, like in this picture of the tri bar, when you draw the picture, you're not quite sure how far, far away that corner is. So you have that freedom of being closer or further. You've also got the freedom here. But having that freedom enables you to have a cohomology. That is to say, you can use the freedom to, you, to build up a contradiction. The contradiction in this picture is actually how you represent fields. I'm not going to go into that here, but I just thought as a digression I would mention. I, there's something else I want to mention here. You see, in my talk last week, I was a little bit disturbed that many people have taken twister theory and moved it off in, to my mind, what was not the right physical direction. In, that, in fact, the, the confluence was very good, I thought, in that respect. I, I learned a lot from it, but let me just point this out to you. You see, you can think of space-time. Space-time, in ordinary Lorentzian space-time, you've got a Lorentzian signature, one plus and three minuses. Well, you might like one minus and three pluses. I prefer the time one to be the positive one for various reasons. Doesn't matter whether that or not, but let's say it's one, three. Atiyah took over and 
did wonderful things with, with Twister theory, but that with the wrong physical signature or pluses. Then Ed Witten took it over and did the opposite thing. He took two times and two spaces. This makes, you see, the Twister theory is complex when you do it this way. And I thought complex relates to complex numbers of quantum field theory. Um, and um, well, the, the positive definite one is quaternionic and the, <clears throat> the Witten version is real. There are various reasons to doing the others which are nice for deep reasons, but if you're doing the physics directly, you want this. There was something else which in my talk, which I talked about, <clears throat> which I was trying to talk about, sorry, I'm jumping ahead. That was a thing picture, yeah, sorry. <clears throat> There's a thing called the split octonians, and I tried to talk about them. I hadn't got it quite right. I think I did get it right yesterday, but I can't mention it in my talk. I, my Polish colleagues were complaining you couldn't do it. And that's because you have to quantize twisted theory. Once you quantize twisted theory, then you do get the split octonians. That's not something I can say, but it's, I'm just trying to indicate that other areas of concern do take us interesting directions, which I hope may influence the thing I am going to talk about now. I'll say why in a minute. This is now going back to the interplay between general relativity and quantum mechanics. And here, I'm talking about the, how much time do I have? About, about 20 minutes, I guess. <clears throat> yeah. Here we have the Big Bang. You see, <clears throat> I was talking about collapse to a singularity in the singularity theorems. Stephen Hawking very quickly picked up, uh, unlike the movie, he wasn't at present at the talk in King's College even though you, in the movie you can see him with sparks coming out of his head or something being inspired by my talk, apparently. Talk was nothing, nothing like any talk I'd ever given, never mind. I did give a repeat in Cambridge. Stephen was there. Following that talk, I had a private session with Stephen, with Brandon Carter, I believe, I think Brandon may have been, been there some of the time. George Ellis was certainly there. And we discussed the techniques I was using. Stephen very quickly picked up on them, developed them, I think the most important development he made was to use the ideas to evolve. The, you see, I had to use the idea of developing from a Cauchy surface. You had to have an initial surface which was non-compact and you evolved to the boundary of the future of the trapped surface. In my argument, had to be a compact surface and this led you to a contradiction. But you needed to assume that the evolution took you from a non-compact space. I mean, it's a perfectly reasonable assumption when you're looking at a local collapse. If you're looking at the whole universe, it's not such, universe, such a simple assumption, then maybe you could have to believe that the universe is, is closed up or something like that, then that theorem wouldn't work. So Stephen developed ideas, and the, one of these ideas was the Cauchy horizon. You look at the what you can evolve from a particular surface and what you can't, and the boundary of it, what does it look like? And there are lots of points in common between this kind of but it's kind of hypersurface and the hypersurface which represents a, a boundary of a future. And he took these arguments. Then we got together and had a, had a, a theorem which more or less encompassed all the weight ones we had before. Now I began thinking about these things a lot and I did wonder, I have to go to the right thing here, what happened in collapse? Well, you see, when you have a lot of black holes combining together, you're going to want to get one with a holy mess. So that'll be very, very complicated, like thing like that. Now, remember thinking about all the different kinds of singular states you can get, many, many solutions, which are very interesting solutions, singularities. And I remember I happened to be at Princeton for a bit, and uh, there was a conference going on at Stevens Institute from Princeton. And I noticed Jim Peebles was sitting in the back of one of the cars. And I asked Jim, I said, well, why don't you cosmologists ever look at all these other interesting kind of models you could have with different kinds of singularities. And you just stick with this boring old uh, Robertson Walker Friedman type of model. I said, why don't you look at any of the others? And he looked at me and said, because the universe is not like that. So I thought to myself, my God, it's not, is it? The universe is not like any of these complicated things. So what you don't see here is a collapse of a generic type with black holes congealing together 
and making a great mess. They will get worse and worse as they combine. The entropy will go up and up. The entropy, the Bekenstein Hawking formula for the entropy in a black hole absolutely dominates everything else. It will be absolutely huge. Now, what happens? Well, why shouldn't this be there in the past? This is the Jim Peebles point. The universe is not like that. The universe is like, well, it's like what we just saw, more or less, like this. This is an even stronger argument because here, I tend to think about things like this. Here we, what about entropy? You see, normally, if you think of a gas in a box or most ordinary systems in physics, imagine that it, there's a smaller box with a compartment there and you close it in there, open the box up, it spreads out. So entropy increases, gas spreads out through the box. That's entropy increasing. It looks more and more uniform, more and more uniform as time goes on. What about a huge now galactic scale box <clears throat> containing a lot of stars? These stars, <clears throat> as time evolves, tend to clump, and clump and clump and then form black holes. It's completely the opposite looking thing. Entropy is still increasing from left to right. <clears throat> but in the gravitational case, the clumpiness is increasing. What we're seeing in the early universe is a combination between top right, bottom left. It's even more striking because if you look at the early measurements in the COBE satellite, as it was, um, of the uh, <clears throat> temperature um, in, in <clears throat> excuse me, for different frequencies, you're looking at the intensity for different frequencies and you get this wonderful point curve. It's even more wonderful than it seems here because these error bars are magnified by a factor of 500. So even the last one, which looked very big, is hugging the curve. The curve is the Planck curve. So what you're seeing is an extremely precise Planck curve. What does that tell us? You're looking at the matter in the universe was to an extremely high degree in thermal equilibrium. You go back and back and back in time, the entropy is supposed to be coming down and down and down, and it reaches a maximum. What? Down and down and reaches a maximum? Well, the universe collapsing, so much isn't that? Make, no, no, it doesn't. You look at it carefully, it's got nothing to do with the fact that the universe is expanding or contracting. It's not to do with that. It is because the universe, for some reason, was in a very, very strange state in its initial beginning. It was not like this thing we just saw. That one, it's not like that. It's like this. Where, and I used to postulate the vial curvature hypothesis. Now you see here, we're getting back to the quantum gravity issue. How does gravity combine with quantum mechanics? Now everybody used to say, and I used to say it myself, the way to understand the singularities is to combine gravity with quantum mechanics because the curvatures are going to get so, so big. In other words, the radii of curvature is going to get so small they're going to get down to 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. They're going to get down to the Planck scale. So what will resolve the singularities is you've got to do quantum gravity. In fact, this is a, also a slightly ironic story because I learned my cosmology, well, I think partly from Fred Hoyle when I listened to radio talks on the radio, we talked about the steady state theory. I was fascinated by it. I went to Cambridge first on a visit, and then I saw Dennis, make Dennis Sharma, and Dennis Sharma uh, tried to get me to do work on cosmology. He taught me an awful lot of cosmology. The steady state model was then uh, very much believed by certainly people in Cambridge, for the very good reason, apparently, that the universe was younger than some of the things in it. Globular clusters seemed to be older than the universe. So you had to have some way of explaining it. The real explanation was that people had the wrong uh, Cepheid variables for measuring the age of the universe. And when they got that right, there wasn't a contradiction. But at the time, there seemed to be a contradiction. And to resolve that, the steady state model was born. So the universe expanded and expanded and expanded and new material was created and it went on like that. When the cosmic microwave Penzias and Wilson discovered the microwave background. I had a great respect for Dennis because after a little bit of struggling, trying to have another explanation for the CMB, he said, no, I was wrong. 
he went around giving lectures saying he was wrong. You don't hear physicists or other scientists doing that very often. I was very impressed by Dennis, his honesty in saying I was wrong. The irony in this, to my way of thinking, is that he then got a lot of people to work on quantum gravity. So the idea was the, black, the Big Bang has to be understood in terms of quantum gravity. Yeah, very reasonable expectation. Why is it so different from the singularities? If it's quantum gravity, why is it so different? This is a huge puzzle. And I thought, well, quantum gravity has got to be a very strange theory where it's not really a proper quantum theory. It's a quantum theory, which is modified by gravity. Maybe the collapse of the wave function is part of this theory. And so it's not quantum theory in the ordinary sense. Maybe it's a theory in which time is not symmetrical. So I toyed with idea, that idea for a long time, making no headway with it, but assuming that in some sense it would predict that the vial curvature, this wonderful thing I described earlier, with four nice and symmetrical spinner indices, this vial curvature had to be zero in the Big Bang. Okay, that was my idea. It wasn't until a little while later that Paul Todd, am I going the right way? No, I'm going the wrong way came up, you see here is it's space time singularities, here's the puzzle. In future singularities, the vial curvature seems to dominate. This is the normal view. In all the models that people produce pretty well, they all dominate. Goes to infinity absolutely wildly, maybe oscillating in some completely crazy way, like the Bilic Bilinski, Kalatnikov, and Lifshitz model, or Misner version. You can see very, very interesting behavior. Vial curvature, very, very interesting, but simply going absolutely wild. Utterly different from the Big Bang. If it's quantum gravity, why is it so different? Okay, different way of looking at it. Here's the different way of looking at it. Don't think of the space time so much as a metric structure. Think of the light cones. In fact, there are most of the arguments that were used in the singularity theorems depend on studying the conformal structure. The actual metric part comes in only a little bit, maybe, in, well, certainly in my original theorem, in the focusing property being positive. So that's most of the arguments have to do with the conformal structure. Light cones, that's the conformal structure in relativity theory. Now you see here is the full metric. This is a local business now. The light cone is not the whole story. It's nine out of the 10 components, or more strictly correctly, it's the ratios of the 10 components nine independent numbers, which give you where the light cone is, how squashed it is, which way it's pointing and all that sort of stuff. Nine numbers. What's the 10th number? Well, here you need to bring together the two most famous formulae of 20th century physics, Einstein's E equals MC squared, of course, and Max Planck's E equals H nu. Nu or F, that's the frequency. Energy, Einstein tells you energy and mass are equivalent, C being a constant. Planck telling you energy, energy and frequency are equivalent, H being constant. Put the two together, that tells you mass and frequency are equivalent. So any massive particle is a clock, a very, very precise clock, right down to the utter fundamentals of the theory. So here we have now, how do they measure time? Well, you've got to have these big hill shaped surfaces and bowl shaped surfaces there which tell you the ticks of the clock. So here we have two particles whizzing by, and the first ticks, well, here's the ticks before, let's start them off here. Yeah. First tick, second tick, third tick, first tick, third, et cetera. So you have to know where these bowl-shaped surfaces are, how crowded are they? That's the one extra number. Okay, now, if you don't have, sorry, I moved in the wrong way. If you just have a photon, the photon doesn't hit any of these surfaces. It doesn't care about the metric. Even more than that, if you look at the Maxwell equations, they are completely insensitive to the metric. You write them the right way, preferably in spinner form as I like to, then you can see that the scale factor can vary from place to place, that doesn't matter. The Maxwell equations are insensitive. Einstein's a little bit more subtle, but in a certain sense, they like to respect the light cones too. Let's move on. It's just the light cones. So if we're thinking about massless things, it's the light cones. Now this is very nice because one can talk about infinity. For a long time, I used to think about gravitational radiation. 
and look at the Vile tensor and the Maxwell tensor. You go out to infinity, squash it down, see this infinity, and you can see the waves coming right past you, and they're a finite thing, and you can do calculations out of infinity, rather than taking horrible looking limits. I found that much easier than the complicated things people used to do, looking at powers of radius and things like that. You just sit at infinity and see what's happening out there. And you can measure the energy, everything, radiation, things like that. That was true when you had asymptotically flat spaces, as it was in those days before we had a cosmological constant. This is a, a wonderful picture due to Escher. There are several of these circle limits, as they're called. This is actually the first one in a way the least sophisticated according to Escher, but it, it's also closest to the mathematics if you like. You can see that this is a representation of hyperbolic geometry. Don't worry about that too much. The point is that these fish creatures think they're all the same size and shape. It's just that they're squashed conformally. Conformally means the same amount in each direction. More specifically in the case of this, the eyes of these fish are circles. They remain exact circles no matter how close to the edge you get. So the squashing is as much in one direction as in another. And you can squash down and make infinity a nice place. You could sit, I could sit out there if I'm not one of these fish. I can at least mathematically think of it and I can do my calculations out there. I can even consider there might be some mysterious world sitting outside Escher's fish world. Now, here is the idea originally due to Paul Todd. I want to go beyond that though. Infinity in the Escher picture, you can squash it down and make it a finite boundary. When you have a cosmological constant, a positive one, I must insist, not the negative one that ADS CFT people like, positive cosmological one, as seems to be observed in observations, it, your infinity is space like. It's also very general. There are theorems due to Helmut Friedrich, which tell you that it, you can have generic. Um, massless fields around too, and you can squash it down very generally into a nice smooth conformal boundary, which is a, it's like a time. It's time infinity, if you like, but it's like a time, it's space-like, and your radiation gets out there. Now, here's the other thing. What about the Big Bang? Now, most of the Big Bangs are a great mess, and they remain a mess whatever you try to do them. The vial curvature goes wild, but what about the vial curvature being zero? Well, maybe you can stretch it out and make it nice boundary. Now, Paul's idea was not to say that the Vile curvature is zero, but to say, let's postulate that you can make a finite boundary. You can stretch it out and make a finite boundary, just a hypothesis. And when you do that, you can pretend you can extend to a fictional pre-Big Bang thing. You can do your calculations locally, which is much nicer. Do your calculations locally, and it gives you a nice way of thinking about the Big Bang. Doesn't mean it's right, but nevertheless, well, when I heard about this, I thought, well, maybe we can go a step further. A step further is to say, well, there is something prior to the Big Bang, and it was the squashed down remote future of a previous eon. I'm calling it an eon, A-E-O-N. Our remote future, when you squash it down, will fix on to the be a stretched out Big Bang of another eon. Does this make any sense whatsoever? Surely not, you might say. The remote future is very, very cold, very rarefied. The Big Bang is hugely hot, very, very dense. But when you do, there's this sort of complementary momentum and energy go in a complementary way to distance and time, and they do just the thing you want. When you squash down infinity, it becomes denser and warmer. When you stretch out the Big Bang, it becomes much less dense and cooler. It seems to me that you could, they would fit pretty well. So I made this suggestion that perhaps this is the picture. Our universe is something like this. It's not like the old steady state model. You certainly have a Big Bang. I should point out you don't have inflation. There are various reasons people introduce this idea of cosmic inflation. There are two things about inflation in relation to this picture. One is it would be a menace. It would just ruin it because the stretch between one eon and the next would be much bigger than the actual eon. I, I don't know the details of it. It depends on how many, how many e, e folds you have, but there would be a huge gap between one and the next and no chance of signals getting through. When I say signals, this is a, an important point. 
and I hope you will hear about these when we get to the <coughs> CCC conformal cyclic cosmology part of this conference, when Christoph Meisner, Raya Gerzijan, and other people will be talking about how signals might get across, what kind of signals might get across, do we see these signals? I think the case for the fact that we do see these signals is pretty strong, but let them try and explain the ideas when we come to them. Um, anyway, it's certainly a possible idea. I should say it's slightly stronger than just saying that you have a boundary here, because if you look at the future conditions, you get the vial curvature actually zero. So it's like the initial postulate I made about the vial curvature vanishing. It's not just that it's finite and smooth, it has to be actually zero to match on. So it's quite a strong condition. And do we see this? Okay, so that's the basis of CCC, which we will hear more about later. Here we have a picture now of a, this is the sort of quantum gravity situation people think about. Here we have a collapsing of a, time going up the picture, a, sorry, it's a, it's a black hole, which had been formed collapsing material. It lasts for a long, long time, maybe Google years, 10 to the 100 years or so, before the big ones will finally start disappearing by Hawking evaporation. They go off with a, finally with a little pop. The pop is where the singularity has got to. A lot of, a lot of things will be, a lot of entropy will be carried away by the, by the evaporation. There will be some left, how, which, how it's, it doesn't really much matter in the picture I provide here, that the radiation, all this picture here at the top, which is a conformal diagram of what happens, when you cross over from one zeon to the next, I'm not quite sure whether my next picture has that. I think that was my last, last picture. But at any rate, the, the thing is that when you have a black hole here, the evolution to the next eon is just a little tiny point there. The mass of that little point can be worked out from the regularity of the crossover elsewhere. And so you could work out how much energy pours through. That point would spread out. There are two observational features. The first one was that I considered was looking at black hole um, collisions here and the gravitational waves from them. Can you see the signals up there? And both Vahe and the Polish people looked at this and seemed to see signals of the sort. The other one was when you uh, supermassive black hole, it doesn't start evaporating until very, very close to this. So it's just a little tiny point, spreads out 380,000 years, and you more or less see a spot in the sky. Do we see these spots? We seem to. Other people will talk about that. Thank you very much. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you, Roger. Can you hear me? Yes, All right, that was, uh, fantastic. Thank you so much. You filled your time and uh, we have time for a few questions. I've been monitoring the, uh, the question and answer as has Abby. So uh, first is a question, uh, kind of a comment that questioned your statement that there's no selective advantage in terms of uh, evolution to being a mathematician. <laughs> uh, this, I forget who asked this, but they pointed out that, that you know, curiosity, insight uh, should uh, hold you in good stead. And I recall some kind of uh, survey that said that mathematicians were maybe the happiest selective group of academics anyway. So any comment on that? Or maybe they're happy. happy. Do, does, do having lots of children make them happy is another question. I don't know. That's, I, I think my point was not to be taken too seriously. I just wanted to say the developing sophisticated mathematics, the kinds of things that you would need to go beyond ordinary um, counting, if you like. I mean, sure, maybe, maybe they're happy. That doesn't mean that they have more kids or that their kids are happy. I have no idea. Is a statistic being done on that? I have no idea. No, I like it. I like to be happy. I like mathematics. I get, I get a great kick out of it. I love it. No, that's, I certainly did it much to the disappointment of my two medically trained parents. They wanted me to be a doctor. And I made this choice. And I walked up to see the headmaster two years from my final years from being in school. And the headmaster said, what did you want to do in their final two years? And I said, I'd like to do biology, chemistry, and mathematics. And in those days, that was a no-no. He said, no, you can't do that. If you want to do biology, you can't do maths. If you want to do mathematics, you can't do biology. 
make your choice. I didn't want to lose the mass. I'd fallen in love with the subject, even though I was supposed to be going to be a doctor. My, both my parents thought, thought so. I dropped my medical career in one fell swoop. I said, chemistry, physics, mathematics. I went home and my parents were furious. <laughs> but there I, can assure you, I, I can assure you not all doctors are happy. <laughs> I can believe you actually, yes. Okay, maybe one or two more. Then uh, um, um, Dr. Iyer, who's a very smart anesthesiologist I know, wants, wants to know if uh, uh, there's phasing in and out of consciousness. And if so, is there a frequency? Oh, goodness me. That's not a question I can answer. I think it's more, more your sort of question. Okay, <clears throat> I mean, I'll so deal with it. Let me just put it one point. I mean, I certainly think that there are degrees of consciousness. There's no question that you could be more or less conscious. I mean, if I'm in a dream, I'm to some extent conscious. I, I can imagine, I can believe myself there, but it's not to the level, the height that I, you know, even when I'm awake, I can certainly experience different levels of consciousness. There's no question about that. So it's not on or off. It can be vaguely on, it can be teeny weensy built on. I believe it's you know, out about animals. You see, I think they talk about Schrodinger's cat and its consciousness. I certainly believe cats are conscious to some degree. No question. I think octopuses are conscious. I think there's a lot of evidence for that. No question in my mind. Their brains are completely different. They're spread out through their tentacles to some degree. So, I mean, one can't pontificate about that. So I would regard consciousness as not a simply clear on-off thing like that. I mean, maybe it is, if there's any of it at all, perhaps it's an on-off thing, but it can certainly be very, very faint. All right, thank you. So uh, uh, the times in, in between conscious moments, maybe we're not conscious. I think that was the, the point of the question, I think. I wouldn't but, uh, know. It depends on whether it's, whether it's discrete, you see. I mean, that's a good point. Is it sort of discrete moments or is there some spread into into that would depend on the <clears throat> theory of consciousness. I don't, I don't have a claim there. I'm not sure whether you do on that one. Okay. Well, uh, in that case, let's let's move on to uh, Dr. Genzel's uh, talk, and you are chairing, Roger. So our okay. technical people here are going to switch over and bring in Dr. Uh, Reinhard Genzel. Dr. Genzel has yes. started his screen sharing. So if you could just introduce him. I'll yes. get out of the way, please. Well, I'm very ha happy that Reinhard Gentel is, is giving a talk here. I was awfully delighted to see that he shared a Nobel Prize. I had seen pictures of the stars circulating this little invisible object, and you often use this in talks, and I thought this was an amazing confirmation of GR. Even more than that, in a certain sense, when I first saw these pictures, my first reaction was, gosh, Kepler was right. You can see these orbits, these elliptical orbits, going around some little point and doing exactly, well, not quite exactly, as we now know, but very, very closely what Kepler had predicted. And this wonderful, I, I mean, I just say how, how important it was that Kepler made these observations and that he and Galileo and Newton were able to start science off in this fantastic way, which now we see the developments. And let's hear what great guy Reinhardt has to say. I, I'm sure it will be a wonderful talk. Thank you. Roger, first off, congratulations. I mean, you are, you know, at, at your age, you are really up, up to snuff to explain to us in, you know, an hour and a half, a vast array of, of the most complicated concepts. I couldn't have done that at any time, and surely not uh, now. So hats off, chapeau. That's that's wonderful, and it's clear that you're one of the, the giants uh, of the field, and I'm very happy to to be here. Of course, uh, you know I I'm an, an experimentalist and observer, and so what what I will talk about is minutiae compared to what what you have done. Uh, uh, nevertheless, it has taken a long time, and, and so that's how I've given uh, my talk this title, uh, A 40-Year Journey. That's really my personal part of this journey. It's actually a longer 
uh, a longer journey. Uh, if you if you look at, you know, I'll tell you a little bit about that, the the, the whole story. So this is about really sh showing, to the extent we can do that nowadays, uh, that the black holes, which which Roger has so wonderfully talked about, really do exist in in nature. And, and, and this is about a particular species of black holes, uh, which we call massive black holes. They, we now know, exist in the centers of galaxies. Almost every galaxy has one. Uh, and they are strongly connected with the evolution of galaxies. So they are not just random occurrences in the universe. They actually, if you like, in a symbiotic relationship with uh, with uh, the the galaxies they're in, and so it's been it's been uh, it's three three parts to this. Of course, one is to show that these objects exist. The second, then, um, that there really uh, are massive black holes or exclude other configurations. And finally, then to use them as a laboratory. So you will see how how uh, uh, we have done this. So, okay, as I said, you know, this is all really building up on, on 100 years uh, of uh, effort on, on general relativity and, and, and one aspect of, and we've heard from Roger about uh, the theoretical part, uh, which, which uh, of course, already in 1916 had in it the concept of a black hole uh, by Schwarzschild's work, with whom you see up, up on top there. Uh, who basically showed uh, the solution of the of the uh, field equations for a spherical symmetric non-rotating configuration, and and in there this concept of an event horizon uh, uh, within which uh, light cannot escape anymore, and therefore, in modern terms, you have your black hole in the sense of no communication. Uh, but then, of course, uh, the singularity is hidden behind the event horizon. And that's a very unfortunate part because as Roger explained, the connection between general relativity as a classical theory on the one hand, and then the singularity at, at its core, uh, both in black holes and then also in the Big Bang is one of the great mysteries um, in physics still now. And we would like to do experiments to, uh, to check that out. And I'm afraid this will become very difficult unless indeed naked black holes, uh, naked singularities do exist. Now, the first evidence uh, that such objects actually uh, were realized in, in the universe showed up in the 1960s. On the one hand, X-ray astronomers, uh, Ricardo Giacconi and others uh, discovered uh, compact bright uh, X-ray emitting stars in binaries. And uh, the idea became uh, pretty clear that uh, in what you might have there is a, a stellar-like black hole orbiting another star. And, and these objects now through measurements I'll describe in a second uh, are really fairly clearly uh, evidence for these stellar black, black hole uh, uh, configurations. The second uh, uh, observation were the so-called quasars. Radio astronomers uh, had discovered new objects, and uh, one such object then was observed by Martin Schmidt with the Palomar uh, telescope. Uh, looked like a star, a faint star, compact stellar object uh, on optical plates, but then when you took a spectrum in the optical, you would see uh, spectral lines in there, uh, whose ratios of wavelengths were all very well known from the laboratory, but they were all uh, as a group redshifted by 15%. Now, nowadays, of course, that's nothing about at the time. Uh, if you interpret that redshift due to the expansion of the universe, which was known, then uh, the, the objects which was discovered then was uh, uh, 2.4 billion light years away, huge distance, such that the, the smudgy little star which you which he had observed had a luminosity of um, a thousand times more than the entire Milky Way with its hundred billions of stars. So how could you possibly explain such objects. And here come in the paradox. Uh, 
uh, as theorists worked on it, for instance, Lyndon Bell and uh, Sir Martin Rees uh, and others, Rashid Sunyayev, for instance, um, the idea was that if you have a black hole and you let material fall onto it or spiral into it, rather, if you have angular momentum, then uh, gravitational energy can get converted into radiation. And before the material disappears eventually in the, within the event horizon, you can convert between about 7% for a non-rotating hole and 40% for a maximum core uh, black hole uh, into radiation. That turns out to be, uh, you know, a, a huge factor, several hundred times uh, more efficient than any kind of fusion. So here you have this conundrum that the objects you call the black hole all of a sudden might be uh, a hugely uh, a, a radiative uh, object. In addition, the observations showed that uh, plasma uh, was streaming away in almost uh, speed of light fashion as collimated jets uh, from such objects. And Roger Blanford will talk more about this, I'm sure. Uh, X-rays were discovered, gamma rays. So these objects are really the, sort of the, the most exciting laboratory of high energy astrophysics. But now how would you prove that these objects are indeed um, such black holes? Well. Uh, certainly the energy arguments are, are interesting, but they're not decisive. You would have to prove it through the measurement of the gravitational potential. That was clear. And in a, in a very foresightful paper in 1971, Lyndon Bell and Rees uh, basically made the following argument. Suppose uh, these quasars are just, so to speak, the active stages of such black holes, which you find rarely in the, in the local universe. Uh, and if, however, every galaxy uh, had a black hole, then you might see the, the quiescent stages of such black holes uh, also in nearby galaxies, including our own. So if you then uh, would look into, say, the center of our Milky Way, which is you know, a factor of several 10 to the four closer than these quasars, then you could actually make uh, measurements of, of dynamics uh, of gas clouds or stars around the central uh, region and, and see whether there might be a sort of a mass concentration. That was the idea. And that was sort of the, the concept, if you like, for the research which followed from then on. Okay, for the next uh, 50, 60 years, that's what many people have tried. Uh, in our galaxy, I'll, I'll tell you more about that, uh, as well as in the external galaxies. And overall, this black hole paradigm uh, indeed has been now experimentally confirmed, although uh, after a long period of time, because as you would see, it took quite a bit of uh, uh, technology and improvement of observational methods. So one of the one of the results now is that in the galactic center we have you know one of the best cases for such a massive black hole, perhaps the best case right now. Uh, and Andrea, I guess, and 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 myself, of course, have shared with Roger the uh, Nobel Prize uh, last year for this for this particular work. In addition, we already had a Nobel Prize going to the detection of gravitational waves and indeed for the in-spiraling of stellar black holes. So if you have a, a two, two black holes um, spiraling into each other, then this characteristic waveforming gravitational waves uh, can give you a decisive way of measuring the mass and also showing that there are black holes. Uh, finally, the radio astronomers have used uh, interferometry so the combination of light from dis distant telescopes in uh, millimeter radiation, where they can have very sharp images in uh, one of the nearby uh, active galactic nuclei, uh, that's not quite a quasar, um, M87, and uh, shown the distribution of radio emission. And there they see uh, a very bright ring of millimeter emission uh, on a darker region in the center. And that is exactly what you would, in fact, qualitatively expect 
from a big black hole surrounded by an active region of hot plasma um, because uh, photons, of course, get also deflected. And when they are within a certain radius, uh, they won't uh, be able to escape the gravitational pull of the black hole and fall in. So you get a dark region in the center. So you see these, these observations, which I, I summarize here, all were made within the last uh, 40 years. And, and, and the successes came actually uh, bang, bang, bang within the, you know, about a decade or so. So things have been speeding up. And as I will tell you at the end of the talk, uh, there's more to expect from the future in, the, in this respect. Okay, so I told you already the, the Linden, Bell and Reese uh, idea. Now there's one uh, slight problem. The galactic center is very close. But unfortunately, when you look at the sky at night, you will see that the center of the Milky Way uh, is, is, is hidden from our, uh, from our eyes through uh, dust in between the stars uh, and between us and the galactic center. So you can not actually use visible light, which, which you would like to, to look at the galactic center. You have to go to longer wavelengths. Initially, radio observations, of course, and then higher energies, X-rays. Uh, and uh, lately then, uh, the technique of infrared astronomy has been sort of big, added an enormous potential to look at the center. So what you see here is a modern picture at the uh, uh, resolution of 10 meter class telescopes in three different infrared bands. So you have a, a, a sense of color so you have cooler objects, which are redder, and, and, and hotter objects, which are bluer. Every one of these objects you see um, is a star. Now, these are not stars like the sun. In fact, the, 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 the whitish looking objects are very massive uh, stars with masses up to 100 solar masses. So that's very surprising, in fact, to, to see that. And the redder things are older stars or dust enshrouded stars. So you see in the center of the Milky Way, and you see there is this marker of one light year, uh, there clearly is a concentration of, of stars, uh, which is about a million times greater than in the solar uh, neighborhood. And so uh, that's a uh, option uh, to, to use to study the uh, gravitational pull, uh, which might be there. The radio astronomers, meanwhile, using these interferometric techniques, showed that this uh, compact radio source, which they detected uh, in, the, in the early 70s, um, in fact, sits in the middle of this, this star cluster. And the size, the angular size of this object, we now know is less than about 40 micro arc seconds. We don't have an image quite yet for technical reasons, which I don't want to discuss here, but we know its size, 40 micro arc seconds. In fact, uh, you will see later, that's just four times the size of the event horizon of a, of a four million solar mass black hole, which uh, for reasons you will see, we now believe to be located there. So uh, this is the spot X, so to speak, where, where the, uh, the, the, the black hole might, might lie. Now, in addition to the stars, there are also gas clouds. In pink, this is ionized gas, which uh, is due to hydrogen, uh, ionized hydrogen recombining and uh, excited by the ultraviolet radiation of the stars, the hot stars in the center. The green is a neutral gas, uh, which uh, is also present. And in fact, uh, these gas clouds are sh obviously have some shape to it uh, due to their motions. And in fact, in the 1970s, uh, Charles Towns at the University of California, Berkeley and his students began in developing spectrometers for looking uh, at the universe for the first time in the infrared. And therefore they could look at the galactic center through this dust and look at the central region and uh, measure the motions of these uh, gas clouds uh, through their Doppler shifts. And the surprising result was that as predicted in fact by, by Lynn Bell and Reese, these motions were very large. 
hundreds of kilo kilometers per second for gas clouds on scales of light years, which if you, uh, you know, convert this into a mass means that somehow, if this is gravitationally induced motion, uh, must be a mass of a few million solar masses. I then joined, in fact, Townsend's group, uh, and uh, together we uh, improved the uh, evidence over the next years uh, on the gas clouds such that we could construct this diagram on the left, which is the enclosed mass on the vertical axis as a function of this radius from Sag A star from this compact radio source. And the boxes show you the estimates and you see at large distances, the mass increases with radius. So that's an extended mass distribution, uh, uh, mostly due to the st stellar distribution in the, in the galactic center. But then inside of, of about a few light years, uh, the mass doesn't seem to change very much anymore. And so uh, that's the evidence therefore, from a dynamical point of view, uh, for a mass, which is a, a few uh, million solar masses. Now, must it be a black hole? No, it, 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 it could have other configurations. For instance, you could imagine uh, a, a cluster of a million neutron stars or other faint uh, stars, which should, wouldn't show up on the, on the infrared images, uh, just sort of bunched together in the, in the center, uh, but together making up a few uh, million solar masses. So it's not clear from this kind of evidence that this must be a black hole. Put it, put it any other way around, the, uh, the radius of a few light years is a million times the event horizon size of a million solar, few million solar mass black hole. So clearly this, this is an indication, it's tantalizing, but it's, 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 it's not a proof. In addition, uh, many people looking at our evidence in the 19, early 1980s felt that gas was an unreliable tracer of gravity because uh, if you have magnetic fields in the central region, which, you, which we know we have, then the, the fields could be strong enough <clears throat> to affect the motions of the gas clouds. Or you have these stars, which I mentioned, very massive stars, they have winds, outflows of gas, and they could push around the gas. So, Gas clouds uh, are not the, the optimum, optimum way of, uh, of, of tracing uh, gravity. So what, what, what should we do? Well, the, the prescription for the next uh, three and a half decades basically was go inside to ever smaller scales and use what is reliable, namely the stars. They are really very good traces of, of gravity. But to do so, you need new technology. And in fact, at that time, I had moved from California to Germany to, in Germany to the Max Planck Institute for Extraterrestrial Physics and built up a group there. And we worked very hard on, on a number of, of, of new avenues. One is to use uh, imaging detectors, which had just been uh, uh, designed and developed for the Hubble Space Telescope uh, for, so that you could make images uh, at a few micrometer radiation, just as you nowadays make images with your, uh, with your camera. In addition, uh, we had to overcome the diffraction, the refraction of the Earth's atmosphere. When a star, a distant star emits light and that light goes through the atmosphere, then the motions in the atmosphere uh, distort the images very badly, in fact, uh, so badly that uh, you can never reach the true diffraction limited resolution of, the, of big telescopes. The solution is so-called adaptive optics where you measure this distortion, then you have a deformable mirror as you see here, and then you calculate what you have to do to the deformable mirror to basically bend the light uh, waves again into a straight line and get sharp images. So that's, that's called adaptive optics, all big telescopes now have these kinds of technologies. In fact, the next generation of extremely large telescopes of size of 30 meters and, and, and greater will probably not work without uh, this kind of uh, technology. And there's many more things we need to do in order to then get 
sharp imagery at the diffraction limit. Sometimes um, there is not a bright enough star uh, where you would like to, to look. So then we've learned to uh, basically make our own stars by shining a laser beam, in this case, uh, the sodium D line uh, into the uh, upper atmosphere, focus it there and use the fact that meteorites which come into the atmosphere from the outside uh, uh, leave a, a thin trace of, of sodium atoms in the upper atmosphere. And they can then be used to resonantly backscatter the sodium radiation, uh, which we send in there backwards to the telescope and then we can analyze it. So the technologies which had to be overcome were very substantial and I'm just summarizing this here, but really took, uh, you know, uh, certainly one and a half, two, two, two decades of, of a number of, of groups in, in the field. Now, in the 1990s, then, uh, we, working with the European Southern Observatory in Chile, using initially a three and a half meter telescope, and then later the so-called very large telescopes with eight meter diameters, and a little later, the group of Andrea Guess, uh, using the so-called Keck telescope, a 10 meter telescope on Mauna Kea, began taking pictures at this uh, very sharp limit, a uh, diffraction limit, of these big telescopes and basically, you know, just took pictures and took pictures again after another time, another time and so forth. So after a few years, we could uh, put this together and in, in this image here, I show you the uh, uh, picture of the galactic center near Sag A star, which is the green cross on a scale of a light month. So that's, you know, a very compact region already in three different years, red is year one, green year two, and blue is uh, year three. And you see there's one star very close to Sag A star, which moves with a velocity of a, you know, about two, 3,000 kilometers per second. So that's 100 times faster than the Earth around the sun. <clears throat> and if you look uh, closer, there are some fainter objects also which move. But then you see, as you go out away from the green cross, the uh, prism effects uh, of the three years uh, become less and less so. That is a qualitative way of basically seeing the Kepler's laws. If you, if you recall, Kepler's laws tell you that the planets mm, at different radii around the moon, uh, orbiting around the sun uh, move with different orbital speeds which scale like one over the square root of the distance from the sun. So the more distant planets move slower than the, the closer in ones. And that's exactly what you see here. So immediately you see in front of you the qualitative evidence for obviously a very concentrated mass, much less than a light month, uh, which, which, which uh, dominates uh, the central mass. And then if you take the velocities, which we see here, then indeed you get, again, a few million solar masses. Exactly the mass which we had found from the gas clouds uh, a decade earlier, but now, of course, um, uh, further in and with much better precision. So the next question is, again, is this, does this have to be a black hole? It's consistent with one, but does it have to be a black hole? Now, the distance we are talking about here is now about 100,000 times the event horizon side at the, at the closest limit. And that's still not good enough to exclude some of the other configurations which had been proposed by various uh, theoretical uh, friends and colleagues. And so we have to still uh, measure more precisely. And in particular, uh, the goal had to be to not just measure statistically the motion, but actually see if possible the orbital uh, uh, characteristic of each individual star. Now that requires enormous uh, precision in measurement and it also time. Uh, but then we were lucky already uh, uh, in the early 2000s with the Keck telescope, Andrea uh, found uh, three stars near, near Sag A star, very close to Sag A star, uh, which had a curvature in their in their uh, uh, path of, of, of motion on the sky. And so she could predict that their orbital periods might be 
on the scale of between 10 and, and 50 years or so. So that was very encouraging. And only two years later, both groups then saw one of these stars take the turn, if you like. Namely, in 2002, we saw that uh, this, this star S2 was very close to Sag J star uh, at a distance of only 17 light hours. That is now about a, a thousand times the event horizon uh, scale and move there with about two and a half the speed, uh, percent the speed of light. So if you calculate again, uh, the mass from this, broadly speaking, you find the same mass again, a few million, three, four million solar uh, masses. But now you, over time, you could actually measure the orbit. And you see that the blue measurements from our group and the red measurements from the Keck group in this first turn, if you like, uh, agreed very well. So we came to the exactly same conclusion that there is a three to four million solar mass uh, object uh, whose size must be sufficiently less than uh, uh, 17 light hours. Now 17 light hours is about four times the orbital radius of the planet Neptune. So really that is, that is already pretty substantial in terms of uh, coming close to the object and there is hardly anything which fits in there. So from an exclusion principle, uh, by around 2005 or so, both groups could say that this is a black hole, a massive black hole, uh, if general relativity is correct. So should we stop? Well, uh, of course, uh, the opportunity here is that we can actually do an experiment uh, to measure still better when the star comes around the next time. You see the orbital uh, period of that star is 16 years. So we knew the star would come back in 2018. And both groups therefore set uh, their eye on this next pericenter approach, which is now three years uh, ago, uh, to measure them even more precisely and perhaps then begin to see effects of general relativity in the orbit, which is really a tall order. I mean, these effects are extremely small on these scales of a few by 10 to minus four. So that, that, that requires quite some measurement accuracy. In the meantime, of course, we also saw not just one or two stars, but a whole set of stars. And that was extremely surprising. These stars we are seeing here are typically between three and 15 times the mass of the sun. So they are fairly young stars actually. Uh, and so they cannot have migrated into the center. And what brought them in here was initially a, a big uh, riddle and it's still not clear. Likely what happens is that binaries, uh, binary stars, which happen to be on an almost radial trajectory, uh, get captured in part when they interact with the, the big black hole, one star gets cap captured, the other one gets, gets shot out. In any case, these are our test particles and nature has been extremely helpful. They were not supposed to be there uh, in any you know, uh, equilibrium picture, but uh, nature has given them to us as test particles for, for measuring uh, gravity. Now at ESO, on Paranal Mountain, we not only have one eight meter telescope, but actually four. So as we were thinking in 2005 and looking forward to the, the next Perry approach, we said, well, what we should do is to actually use interferometry just like in the radio, but now actually in the, in the infrared and combine the light from these four tels meter, uh, eight meter telescopes together, thereby uh, creating what is the equivalent of a 150 meter diameter telescope and, and which then has a resolution which is about 15, 20 times larger than a single telescope and also much higher precision in the astrometry, so in the accuracy of measuring uh, stellar positions. So that was our goal. It was a very difficult experiment, um, which uh, Frank Eisenhower and the team of European uh, institutes in Germany, France, <coughs> Portugal, 
and ESO put together over the next uh, 10 years, but we were already in time. And so uh, I can now summarize to you what, what we've been, been seeing. So that was a state, that was an image at the start of all of this. So that's, that's what, what we call a, a seeing limited image. These are these bright stars, which you saw, but with a poor resolution uh, due to, to this, this seeing limited resolution. Then the adaptive optics basically now, uh, you know, improves things by about a factor of uh, 20 and you can uh, get down to about 50 milli arc second uh, resolution. And with gravity, uh, if we look at this region around the star S2 there with uh, measurements, which we took only a few uh, months ago and weeks ago, then all of a sudden where there is one point uh, in, on an adaptive optics image, we see typically four or five objects down to magnitudes, which we cannot, uh, we could not reach uh, before that. And the motions of some of these stars are horrendous. The object which is closest to the center and the center indeed is the black hole emitting itself. That's the yellow object there at zero, zero. And the object next to it, which is labeled K equals 17, uh, moves there uh, uh, with a velocity of about 9,000 kilometers per second. So it actually uh, broke the record uh, two, two months ago uh, of, the, of the star S2, which I have been uh, talking to you. And now we are seeing, in fact, uh, this year alone, uh, we've seen three stars going through Perry. Uh, it's it's just like where we thought there was a village uh, with a with a star coming through, so to speak, every few years. And this is more like New York City at night, uh, where you know lots of stars are. This is fantastic because it allows us to make precision measurements uh, of the potential. So what do we what do we find? So we start off with this picture of the the, uh, the orbital distribution from a large scale, uh, then we can zoom in. And as, as I described, we have in the very center, a configuration with um, uh, four stars, which go very close to the center on a, with a parallel distance of about uh, between 80 and 100 times the Earth, Earth uh, uh, orbital radius. Um, S2 is the blues, blue curve, uh, S2 parried in 2018, as I described. And when it did, uh, here again, in, in, in even a slightly higher resolution, uh, when it did, uh, we could see the motion uh, in 2018 from night to night, where previously with the adaptive optics technology, uh, we had to wait for a month or two uh, or even a year to see these motions. So here we could measure from, from, from night to night and with a uh, very, very high precision. So we can really uh, see the details of the, of the orbits to, to high precision. Then this year, uh, so this was three years ago. Then this year, another star, the one in red and orange came through and parried at you know, a similar uh, radius uh, even a little inside of that of, of S2 um, uh, from, from the black hole. And there's two more stars in the, the gray pattern, the gray orbit, and then a green, uh, which are also going through Perry a little further out. So with these uh, very precise measurements on, on, on several stars, we can now really nail down not only the shapes of the orbits, but also the mass uh, location and the mass uh, uh, itself, also the distance to the galactic center. So we now know the, the center of the, of the, of, of the orbital uh, motions to uh, a few light hours. And um, we can see effects due to general relativity. The first such effect is the so-called gravitational redshift. So when the star S2 went through its uh, closest approach to its peri, uh, then it makes this very sharp transition from very high positive to high, high negative velocity, as you see, as the, the star swings around by the black hole. And uh, the light which is coming out at that point has to, of course, uh, come out of the potential of the black hole from, 
uh, to us. The clocks are going slower uh, near the black hole. So the, if you subtract the, uh, the Newtonian part of the orbit, then there is a uh, effect due to general relativity is called the gravitational uh, redshift. So if you plot the Newton orbit here uh, as a horizontal gray line, then the uh, effects due to general relativity uh, are predicted to be the red line. And you see that the data, which are the cyan uh, measurement points, perfectly fit, uh, fit that red line. So we have a confirmation of the, uh, the redshift prediction of general relativity uh, to about 30, 30 times uh, the uncertainty, 30 sigma. Another effect um, is the so-called uh, precession of the orbit. So in Newton, if you have a single planet uh, orbiting the sun on say on a circular or elliptical orbit, then that orbital shape would stay in space constant. It would always do the same orbit. Not so in general relativity. In general relativity, such a, a star would precess in the orbit of the, of the motion. And in the case of S2, that's a 12 arc minute per, per orbit uh, motion. And we can see that in two ways. In the, do, in the, in the bottom uh, diagram on the left side, that's the X coordinate as a function of time. Again, the Newton orbit is the gray line and the general relativity point is the, is the red line. And you see the, the general relativity orbit uh, has so basically a kink that's the, the, the precession is a strong function of radius. And so as the, as the star comes in, it initially is on a quasi Kepler orbit. And then as it comes in, the precession sets in and it, it basically precesses uh, very rapidly to a new Kepler orbit. Uh, you can also plot the angle on the sky, which is in the bottom right. So there you see initially it comes in at zero and then it comes out at about uh, 12 arc minutes or so. Uh, another way to see the precession is now, uh, as the star S2 has moved away, we can compare the, the, the locations of the star uh, we measure this year, which are the dark blue uh, uh, objects on the right upper uh, figure, uh, with the one last time, 18 years, uh, 16 years ago. That's the open blue uh, measurements. Now, they weren't as accurate as what we can get now, but you clearly see that offset to the right, just by the right amount. And so from this, we can see that the orbit is indeed uh, uh, also astrometrically uh, uh, described by a perfect uh, uh, effect due to the general relativity, which is now measured to, it is this precession is measured to about 15 times the uh, uncertainty. Finally, we can look at the uh, black hole itself. At radio wavelengths, uh, the radio astronomers use VLBI, as I described it already before, very long baseline interferometry to resolve or try to resolve the central source. And you see in three millimeter VLBI, which is the best we currently have, the source is about 40 micro arc second in diameter. That is about four times the event horizon size uh, uh, of a four million solar mass black hole, which we get from the um, dynamic measurements. In the infrared, uh, the black hole uh, is there, but it's highly variable and sometimes has large excursions, which you call flares. And during the flares, we've discovered that the centroid of the uh, emission actually wanders around fairly rapidly with about a third the speed of light apparently in sort of a, uh, a loop-like configuration or an, an orbital-like configuration on scales of 10 times the event horizon size. So in fact, on that scale, that again is the coordinate speed uh, of a circular orbit uh, approximately uh, at 10 times the event horizon size. So that is, is about as close as you can hope to get to the, the central black hole. So you can ask now the question, um, are we sure? Can we can we be sure that this is a is a black hole? Well, we've we've come a long ways uh, over the last forty years, as I tried to explain to you from the times of uh, Charles Townes' first experiments. 
uh, where we were at about uh, a few light years from the center. Uh, and we found that there was a central mass of a few million solar masses. We've now uh, have come inwards with these various measurements all the way to uh, a few times the event horizon size, 10 times the event horizon size to show that indeed there's approximately uh, the same mass of, of 4 million solar masses there. So there's only a single dominating mass, uh, nothing else. And uh, in fact, the, the, the high quality of the Schwarzschild precision also gives us a strong limit on any extended mass inside the uh, S2 orbit. And that's uh, delineated by this two red arrows for the peri and the upper part of the orbit. So there's not much else what could fit in there. In fact, you can analyze this in, in various ways and find <clears throat> that any secondary black hole uh, you might want to put in here cannot be more massive than, than say, uh, you know, a few hundred to a thousand solar masses within the uh, you know, the orbit of, of S2. So we've tested GR to at least to first order and uh, general relativity has, has passed that test again, now in a spectacular fashion around a, uh, a million solar mass black hole. We've tested the equivalence principle by checking the local positional invariance, which also is, is tested uh, at, at the level of a few percent. And as I, as I explained, we, we see these flares, which are plausibly gas clouds in the innermost accretion zone, which, which seem to orbit uh, the central black hole. So, you know, we can, we can be very confident now that we've excluded everything uh, which is possibly, uh, you know, or likely to be the case, and that, that this is indeed a, a massive black hole. But it's still not done, I would say, because what we really, would like to do, I go on to the last slide. What we really like to do is to test the so-called no hair theorem. General relativity says that uh, you only need the mass of the black hole M and its spin A and all other parameters. So for instance, the quadrupole moment, moment Q uh, can be calculated from these two numbers. So you only have two quantum numbers of the black hole if you like. The nuisance parameter epsilon there, therefore, is in general relativity zero while it isn't in other theories. Current measurements, that is our, the data I've, I've shown to you, the gravitational uh, wave experiments of LIGO uh, uh, limit epsilon in these two cases to somewhere between 0.3 and, and 1. If we could uh, combine our gravity experiment with an EHT image as good as the donut from M87, uh, so if our colleagues, our VLBI colleagues can uh, uh, make such an image for the galactic center, then we could push this to perhaps 0.1. If there were a pulsar in, in this innermost region because of the high precision of the timing of a pulsar, then what could jump another factor of two. In the end, the ultimate experiment is a so-called extreme mass ratio in spiral uh, into a massive black hole in a distant or um, moderately distant massive black hole, which you see in gravitational waves. That, that experiment um, is planned to take place uh, with a space mission, which is planned by the European Space Agency, ESA, uh, in about 15 to uh, 18 years from now, so still still some time to go. But that, if it if it if it works, uh, will really then uh, make an endpoint and really uh, test the current space time uh, of uh, general relativity. Will we ever see what uh, Roger talked about, namely the quantum part? I'm not sure. Uh, uh, there may be. There may be effects uh, due to the Hawking radiation, which, uh, which perhaps at one point in the future might be visible, but it's gonna be very high, very hard. Nevertheless, I think this has been, a, for me at least, has been a, a fantastic 40 years and we are going at it hard. 
some of the measurements I showed you were, were taken last night uh, on the telescope. So we are, we are at it now, and so is Andrea. And there's a bright future uh, to walk on the path which Roger has uh, shown us where to go. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Roger. Um, we need you to un unmute and come back, please. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? I can oh, hear we you. can. OK, yes, please. Uh, okay. No, great you. talk. Thank you very much. I thought that was really interesting. And uh, I, do we have questions from people? Or? Yeah. Yeah, do you, there are some in the chat lines, uh, chat line I can read, or the Q&A line I can read. Um, yes, yes, I, I can't see them. Okay, there's one from uh, Werner Benger. There are space-like and time-like singularities for black holes, Schwarzschild black holes versus Kerr black holes. Do such properties also make sense for the universe to define? Would it rather be time-like? The singularity. Yeah, I'm not sure if that makes I think I, well, let me put it as my understanding of the question, may, may not be quite as stated. I mean, one way of putting the cosmic censorship issue, in other words, you don't see naked singularities, is that time-like singularities are unstable. So you, so you don't see the time-like ones. I don't know how you would tell, actually, with any kind of <laughs> observation at the moment. I, as Reinhardt was saying, I mean, we're just looking at black holes where the singularities are hidden, and so you're not um, seeing directly to a singularity. See, when I first gave my talk at King's College, I remember being slightly disappointed <laughs> that, that uh, it didn't show you could see singularities. I mean, they're all, as far as the theory goes, to be expected to be hidden. You just don't expect to see them. But time-like ones would violate cosmic censorship. So you might, if they were there, you might see them, but I think it's unlikely. If that's a, I don't know if that was the question exactly. I'm not sure either. Reinhardt, do you have a comment on that? No, no, no. Here's another question from Yang Kao. Uh, so Einstein's paper on electrodynamics of moving bodies was on Schwarzschild, Schwarzschild, Schwarzschild and Kerr black holes, question mark. And then there's another one from him, him or her. Would charge black holes electromagnetic singularity be found with comparison to spins of Kerr and Kerr Newman. Yeah, Can they no, be I, mean, I think I'm, I'm sure that Roger will, 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 will tackle that. But of course, if you have a, a net charge, you immediately get a current. And so you then you would discharge the, the, the object. So that's why we are not we are not considering Carter black holes in, in as, as a as a as an option. But of course, uh, in, in, in the cases near, near the event horizon, as Roger will explain, uh, the vacuum gets polarized uh, and, and uh, you know, positive and negative charges emanate at, at high energy. So there, there are charges, of course, but not a charge of the black hole. Roger, is that what have I expressed? <laughs> well, I certainly wouldn't expect, I mean, <laughs> uh, the charge would have to be very tiny, I imagine. I mean, I'm, I'm not an astrophysicist, so I wouldn't be able to guess. Uh, I mean, know very clearly. I mean, it's a, it's a shame in a way that you don't get this other parameter because, you, as you, as Reinhardt would mention, you you have these two parameters, basically the A and the M, in the Kerr solution. But if you had a Kerr-Newman solution, you have another parameter for the charge, but the charge is not expected to be. I mean, you, the sort of thing you wouldn't expect to be very high at all. I have no idea what, what effects might possibly produce a small charge. I have no idea. Okay, thank you very much. Reinhard uh, Genzel, thank you very much for a wonderful talk. And uh, stick around uh, for a discussion a little bit later. And Roger, we don't have you on video at the moment, but we hear you. Would you could you please introduce uh, Roger Blanford, who's waiting? I'm, yes, no, I'm very glad that Roger Blanford is able to give a talk. He was uh, very much part of the initial explanation of how quasars behaved and how they could come about from black holes. And his work with Znayek, I seem to remember. And then he has this very interesting looking new paper, which perhaps he'll talk about. So I think studying what goes around, what goes on around a black hole 
He's one of the great masters of the subject. So let's hear what he has to say. Well, thank you very much, Roger and Reinhardt for wonderful talk, truly wonderful talk. But I learned a lot. And it is, of course, a great pleasure and honor to be here to help celebrate um, Roger Penrose's uh, 90th birthday. And um, uh, my, my interactions, I suppose, with, with Roger began as a, uh, it, of course, completely remotely as a child, uh, when, like many other school children in Britain, we were exposed to things like the Penrose Tri Bar and so on. And, um, and then as, as a uh, graduate student in, um, in Cambridge, um, uh, my, my teachers were, you know, were, were Martin Rees and, and Stephen Hawking have already uh, come up and Brandon Carter and Dennis Sharma and Donald Lyndon Bell and George Ellis and many other people. Um, and they were obviously pioneers like Roger, but, and they were not instinctively deferential people, but it was absolutely clear to me then that uh, Roger was regarded as both mathematically and in terms of originality, a singularity, if I may, if I may use that expression. Um, uh, so uh, I learned about the, um, uh, obviously about, started to learn about some of the things he'd done, uh, re relativity and so on, and the um, Penrose diagram, which you can see there. And then uh, jumping forward a little bit, I, 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 I'm a great fan of his uh, so-called popular books. And uh, here's a diagram from one of them. Um, now, no one in their right mind would try and expen explain covariant differentiation in a popular book. However, somebody did, and it was Roger, and I have to teach covariant differentiation to graduate students. And the, the figures that he gets there, and Roger's approach to this, I'm a tremendous, didactically, I think they're wonderful. And they've certainly had a big impact on me. Um, and you, you begin to see a picture here that, that it is a picture, that Roger's an extremely um, uh, hyperactive visual thinker. And uh, in fact, I had a bit, a bit of an illustration of this once when I was on a, a committee with him. Um, uh, I think it was a, a German research institute and we were uh, listening to a, a, an earnest um, uh, uh, exposition on, on the third order perturbation to the management structure and for some unaccountable reason, Roger's imagination faltered and he pulled out a book and then started filling pages and pages with pictures all over the place. And so clearly it's a large part of it, uh, of, of it, his anger and, and his sort of graphical skill is, is sort of sort of amazing. Um, and then sort of a final sort of graphical tribute was uh, a few years ago I got asked to go to a, a sort of uh, sort of semi-opening of the of the transit center in San Francisco, which is uh, uh, covered in 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 in, Pen, in Penrose tiles, and, uh, and and this and this was lovely, and um, and actually at that time I was asked to. Um, uh, uh, I, I, I had been asked to attend some uh, uh, local celebration for an organization called Comicon, um, and I didn't know anything about this, uh, but my grandchildren explained to me just how important this was, and so I, I agreed and I went along to this, and then they said, we see Roger Penrose is in town, will you persuade him to come to and be on a panel and all that sort of thing, um, and, and somewhat to my surprise, he agreed, and I have to say, I think he enjoyed it almost as much as my grandchildren. So uh, it, 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 it's a, uh, a, a lovely term. So, um, so I, I, the sort of idea of the the sort of the graphics, I think, will uh, come out in what I'm uh, what I'm going to try and explain a little bit to you in 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 in, in the slides available. Now, here's here's a. a, a uh, obviously, black holes have become rather famous recently over the last few years. They've always been with us, but they've become really quite famous now. And uh, in his wonderful talk, Reinhardt has explained what 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 they do, the, the two Nobel prizes, and so on. And um, and uh, and uh, uh, but again, there's a lot more going on. Um, there's the Event Horizon Telescope, which I'll say more about. This famous image, which you see see in the middle there of the of the uh, ring of uh, a plasma in, in M87, uh, the gamma ray burst, which are probably in two out of three types of gamma ray burst are the, are the birth cries of black holes. 
Um, the very highest energy cosmic rays, which have the same sort of energy as a well-hit baseball. Um, they, the, probably the most favorite uh, origin for those are uh, jet, jets coming out of black holes, I'll say a little bit about. The gamma ray frontier is being pushed as we speak up to PEV energies. Again, black holes are blamed. And then the neutrino frontier is, uh, we've seen neutrino sources that coming from the cosmos. Again, the culprit is believed to be black holes. Um, I, 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 when I actually saw, uh, when I heard about the, um, the latest Nobel Prize, uh, one on, on the bottom right hand corner here, um, I, I, my, my, my first reaction, of course, was one of elation. I knew all, 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 all three awardees and I was thrilled for them. But my second one, just to refer back to something that was said, was um, maybe black holes do have hair after all. So um, anyway, let me, let me move on. Um, and uh, now I'm going to say just a little bit. I'm I've kept I'm not going to go into any 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 sort of formal or mathematical details here, but just say a little bit about um, uh, uh, classical black holes. Of course, as, as has been mentioned, they were um, introduced unwittingly, probably by Schwarzschild uh, in 19, 1915, and then wittingly, I think, by Lemaitre, Oppenheimer, Wheeler, Zeldovich, and many other people, and a, a major development uh, was by uh, Roy Kerr. I mean, many other pe people who we credited for this, there's no time for that, but Roy Kerr in 1963 found a mathematical description of the space-time that, that sort of looked a little bit like the Schwarzschild black hole. And then I think he, under, he understood and other people caught up eventually and realized it wasn't just a sort of space-time, it was a, the description, the formal complete mathematical description of the sort of black hole that we now believe uh, that, that we're observing in many, many environments in, as, in astronomy. And this is a sort of remarkable thing. It's described by just two numbers. So in that sense, it's simpler than the electrons. The business about charge came up. There are many more types of black hole that have been discussed, including most famously those that carry charge. But in astronomy, for the reason Reinhardt gave, we do not think um, uh, that they are the ones we're looking at. It's really the ones that Roy Kerr found. Um, and he found this, you know, he announced this at the same time as the quasars, <laughs> Martin Schmidt found quasars and so on. So it's kind of nice that it happened that way. And, uh, and they have a, an event horizon, um, and which is classical. It's a point of no return for these big black holes. Not even Hollywood can get through that. Um, there are many other things that were found in the 10 years following the Kerr solution. There were, there were many things that were found that were um, sort of amazing, you know, developments one after the other that sort of substantiated the statements I've just made. And I'll just let me just call out, uh, I'll mention Roger Penrose in one of the other things he did in a, in a short while, but I'll also call out Stephen Hawking's area theorem, um, which said that in in playing around with black holes using the sort of techniques that Roger developed, uh, you, uh, you classically, you've got to increase their area. And this became a sort of a metaphor for thermodynamics. It was a bit like entropy and so on. And then of course, what actually happened um, was that um, this, this turned out not to be a metaphor, but something extremely real. So, you know, in, in, in the, Free, uh, free brile imaginings of theoretical physicists, the black holes are a very rich, uh, extremely rich and have been very productive. Um, uh, I, 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 I guess I'm an astronomer and uh, true to my sort of bourgeois uh, English upbringing. Uh, I, 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 I'm sort of don't look behind the curtain as it were. Um, whereas theoretical physicists have no such hesitation and you can either look at what they do as a sort of a, a prurient peeping on the violent dissipation and quantum depravity that's going on or, uh, or the neo-scholastic disputation with thought experiments or whatever. And you may say it's all good, good keen fun and so on, but the, what has actually happened is that it is really, the black holes have provided uh, a, 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 a sort of a, a, an arena, if you like, in which terribly important, terribly interesting questions in theoretical physics, and in particular the interface with quantum mechanics, uh, have been asked, and, more, and many of them have been, to all intents and purposes, answered. And of course, the first of these was taking this analogy with between entropy 
and an area and showing that it, it wasn't an analogy, it was a real thing and black holes have a temperature and so on which Stephen Hawking famously did. Um, but there's much more that's gone on since then. And you know, sort of important and challenging questions in theoretical physics have been, be, have been asked and answered courtesy of the black hole. And Roger got this go, all of this going. Um, and so the theoretical physicists sort of see you know, the black holes, if you like, as a sort of stage. And they're interested in the, in the scenery and the stagecraft and the um, uh, electrics and all of that. And, you know, insofar as I represent the astronomy community, uh, we just want to sit in the audience and watch the shows that the universe puts on for us. And so, um, uh, you know, the way we do this is, of course, look at the gas that's swirling around the black hole and see it get hot and radiate and so on. And that's the radiation. I'll come back in a little bit in a minute. But for us, I think the play's the thing. And that's, I'll, I'll say a li little bit more about this. Now, if we go to this, this sort of more theoret theoretical diagram, very simple, very simple, here, there's this region, uh, the event horizon, which you all know about, which is the point of no return. But outside is the second region, shown schematically here, that exists for a spinning black hole. And this is called the ergosphere. And I will say a bit more about this. In fact, I'll do that, I think, in the next, in the next slide. Or I'd like to talk about a tiny bit about what's called the Penrose process. Let me just introduce this by saying uh, that if we look at the solar system and look at the three inner planets, Earth, Venus, and Mercury orbiting the sun, shown schematically here, um, or I could just as easily have used uh, Reinhardt and Andreas stars orbiting the black hole in the galactic center. If you consider the Earth, it has a certain energy as some of its kinetic and its gravitational potential energy. And as uh, physics students learn early on, um, uh, the sum of those two is negative. It has a negative energy. Um, the same is true for Venus and Mercury, of course, but they're more negative. So in going from, if you took Earth and then transferred it into the orbit of Venus or Mercury, you would lose energy. The energy would decrease and it would be released. And if we go back to the, the, the black hole hit with the accretion disk around it, something similar is happening as gas goes from a large radius to a smaller radius. It's losing energy and it's being released. Now, if we go, go back to this diagram again, uh, we'd say, well, there's negative energy there. But then Albert Einstein, just in the context of special relativity, told us that Earth, Venus, and Mercury have a, um, have a rest mass energy. And that rest mass energy will make the total energy of Earth, Venus, and Mercury make it be positive. And so uh, the total energy would then be es essentially positive. And, um, uh, and, but this is where Roger Penrose came in in 69, and he pointed out that if you go into this region called the ergosphere here, there are just perfectly proper orbits with this sort of relativistic generalization of Kepler's laws, if you like. Uh, and even if you include the rest mass, you can find orbits that will only exist inside the ergosphere and they can have negative total energy. And that's a, a remarkable thing because, as he realized very graphically, you could then uh, create a rock, have a rock, have an intrepid astronaut go into the ergosphere, throw a rock into the black hole, and that uh, as it would have negative total energy, it must decrease the energy of the black hole. And when you go through this properly, you find it, it all, all hangs together. Energy is conserved in, the, in this, defined in this way. And the, and the black hole has lost energy. So the black hole has lost energy by having a rock thrown into it by some intrepid astronaut inside the ergosphere. Now, what is going on, if you think about this in a more non-black non hole way, is that some fraction of the energy of the rest mass energy of the black hole when it's spinning, some fraction of that energy is associated with the rotation. And just as with a top, it's extractable. We can take it out. And it turns out that in the limit, if you take the sort of maximal black hole, about 30% of the black hole energy is extractable in, in principle, and about 10% is like can be extracted in, in, in practice. So uh, this is. A, terribly important for understanding black holes per se as sort of theoretical objects, but my contention here is in fact it's 
is just as important for understanding them as observed astronomical sources. And um, uh, now the particular um, uh, thought experiment that Roger went through, where you needed an, astro uh, an astronaut in some sense to, to perform, or an engineer or a student or whatever, to perform this experiment for you and to extract the energy and then and then have a lot of conveyor belts and ring and pulleys and all of that sort of thing. Uh, in practice, that does not, people have tried quite hard, but it's rather hard to make that work in any way efficiently or realistically in an astrophysical environment. But the thought experiment is the important one. And I'll come to another way of doing the same trick in the moment. So before I do that, I want, I want to go back to my uh, title. Um, and that, as I said, uh, I'll do black holes behave uh, in the way that human beings are sometimes um, talked about uh, in, in terms of uh, are there, is their behavior attributable to nurture or nature? Um, and I'm certainly going to, not going to end into that, that debate. That may, be, may, may come, up, come up in the second day, I don't know. But in the case of, of black holes, the, 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 mo the way that most of them behave is that they, if we have a black hole, say here, this is a little gray, but never mind, um, and we have a, um, a disk of gas orbiting it, and that disk of gas uh, that is orbiting the, this, it is differentially rotating, just like the planets are, and there's a magnetic friction that operates in this. And when friction operates with that differential rotation, it'll do two things. One is it will uh, send um, what we call angular momentum. It'll send that outwards, and that allows the gas to fall inwards. But the other thing is it must do is it must cause it must cause heating, and that heating will heat the gas and cause it to glow in the dark for the gratification of astronomers and so on. Actually, radio astronomers don't need the dark, but it's still for their gratification. You can ha have it glow as well, and uh, and in. And in a traditional accretion disk, as this is called, roughly in round numbers, 10% of the rest mass energy of all the gas that is supplied at much larger radius than is present on this slide is going to be released when it gets into uh, the lowest stable circular orbit, as it's usually called, ISCO it's sometimes called, which is quite close to the black hole. And then if you take a very simple-minded view of this disk, then the gas will just plunge in across the event horizon and release no more energy, uh, but it will have released about uh, roughly twiddle 10% of its, of its rest mass energy uh, as, as radiation and so on. Now, this is a, a sort of a simplest, if you like, type of accretion disk, and many that are observed are somewhat like this. Um, and they are, of course, prodigiously powerful. Um, uh, nuclear power is truly impressive compared with chemical power, but gravitational power is twiddles 100 times nuclear power. So, uh, so it's not surprising these, the brightest objects in the universe include amongst them many accreting black holes. Now, there's a variant on this idea, which is sort of conventional as it's been around for a long time, is that when the, sorry, when the gas in the middle um, is not able to cool, whoops, somewhat unstable, never mind, uh, when the gas in the middle is not able to cool, then the, uh, then the gas will, the, 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 the gas in the middle, the disk will become very thick and it'll become a sort of torus. And I'll come back to that point in a moment, but I'll use this diagram just to demonstrate that. And we'll, we'll return to this diagram and explain a few more things about it. So, so that was the sort of, uh, if you like, the sort of, sorry, let me go back. That, if you like, was the, uh, the, the release of gravitational energy. This is gravitational power, if you like. Um, and uh, this, uh, this I'm going to call nurture because it's feeding the black hole. And so it's sort of what's happening in real time. And that's, that's what the astronomer sees. But there's this other, other channel, which uh, Ro Roger really pointed to these, well, there were other people too, but he was one of the, the people who really got to the nub of the matter, which is the, this is the rotational energy here. And instead of having an astronaut throwing rocks into the, um, into the black hole, um, an alternative way of tapping this rotational energy, which uh, Romans Nyack and I thought about uh, uh, 45 years or so ago, um, was 
uh, to use magne magnetic field or more precisely the electromagnetic field to use this electromagnetic field as shown sort of I, this is going to yeah that's uh, that's a, this is this is a, a sort of new, a simple numerical simulation there are much more sophisticated ones done now but this brings out the main points and the the blue part contains those um, uh, a magnetic contains magnetic field lines shown with arrows attached to them a bit like the earth's magnetic field and so on but those magnetic field lines as you can see go through the event horizon of the black hole and they're held in place by one of these thick uh, thickened accretion disks which you saw on, on the last slide so that's that's a sort of general picture and that's a model of what of what goes on in many of these sources now, if you think about it from a, from a physics point of view, what is actually happening is that the black hole and its, its event horizon are behaving a bit like an electrical conductor. And they'll have a resistance of roughly about 100 ohms, uh, for those of you who know Ohm's law and so, and so on. So the black hole behaves a little bit like a, a conductor. It's, um, it, it induces an, elect an electromotive force or, or equivalently a voltage. So the spin, when you've got a magnetic field there, causes a voltage, and the voltage is impressively large. It's typically, for a, an active galactic nucleus, it's 10 to the 18 to 10 to the 20 volts. And using Ohm's law, the, the, the voltage causes a current to flow in this EMF, which is about 10 to the 16 to 18 amps. And the product of those two is going to give you the power roughly in watts. Some of the power is dissipated inside the horizon, and so it's behind the curtain. And as I say, as an astronomer, I'm not going to be so curious about what's going on there. But uh, for the, the other half is essentially dissipated outside. And that makes structures. And in particular, the structure that you're seeing here is something called a jet, which I'll come to, I think, on the next, on the next slide. Um, if I uh, look at this slide here at the bottom, where it says the Crab Nebula, the Crab Nebula is, um, is a famous supernova remnant of a supernova that happened in AD 1054. In the middle of it, as you see here, there is a, a famous pulsar, a spinning magnetized neutron star. And as it's spinning and it's magnetized, it too behaves in an analogous fashion to the black hole as depicted here. And it too makes an electromotive force and makes uh, currents and uh, sends electromagnetic power into the surrounding Crab Nebula, which is uh, seen by, um, by astronomers throughout the electromagnetic spectrum. Now, in, in, in a way that's analogous to Roger, Roger Penrose's thought experiment, um, if, you, if you think about what's going on here, then a, an observer sort of hovering just above the horizon, rotating with the angular velocity of the black hole, will see electromagnetic power entering the hole. But from the point of view of a distant observer not rotating, the power that is conserved will be exiting. So that's a way of sort of resolving, if you like, a, a conundrum. So the bottom line here is that magnetic field supported by external gas or held in place by external gas can extract spin energy from a black hole efficiently. And this rotational power is, um, is, is very important. And it, it, it's a sort of second source. It's a bit like with the sun in the 19th century, people thought the sun was essentially powered by gravitational energy. Then they came to realize this was not enough. And so they invented nuclear reactions in the center of the sun to power it and keep us warm for, for, uh, for four and a half billion years. And, um, uh, and here we've got a sort of second, if you like, channel for power, it, it, which is the spin of the black hole. So, um, so I said that those, um, the, the simulation I showed you there and the other sort of cartoons were actually uh, producing something that the the original mechanism was in fact designed to explain which is what are called jets so in, a, in addition to accretion disks uh, accreting objects and specifically black holes in this case do uh, make these structures called jets which we now know come from very close at least very close to the black hole and I'm going to assert that they actually are made by the black hole in the nucleus of a, uh, of a of in this case of a galaxy here's a sort of uh, we know thousands of these things 
here, here are just some examples. There's a black hole there and they, these jets squirt all the way outside the galaxy. Here's some more examples here. Here's an X-ray image of a jet. There's a black hole here. This is a dead straight jet defying all our knowledge of instabilities and so on. And there's a beam dump up at the end there. And uh, so I'm not going to go into any of the details of this, but I'll tell you two things that are relatively important, which are that the two things are uh, that, that are Sorry, excuse that distraction. Um, the, uh, the two things that are important here are that the jets uh, are observed to be moving with speeds almost close to the speed of light. And this means, as we now teach freshmen in, in physics, they, they move, they move, um, sorry, sorry, excuse that distraction. Um, that, that means that they, um, uh, they, move, they, they observe to move faster than the speed of light, so-called superluminal expansion, superluminal motion. Here's a, a very old picture, and you can see if you just do the math here, that this is a source, it's actually a quasar, that it, where you see features apparently moving across the, the sky at 10 times the speed of light. It's only an illusion but it's an important indication that these are ultra relativistic outflows, another good indication that black holes are responsible. Now in trying to model these things, um, uh, it's important to get the sort of kinematics of how the, the uh, light leaves the sources of radiation in the jets. And um, uh, in 1959, uh, Roger Penrose and independently Jim Terrell uh, realized that what most people have thought about, including actually Einstein in some of his popular books, is if you imagine a body moving relativistically across the line of sight, it would just be length contracted and so on. Not quite so. It will appear to rotate, and that's sort of shown graphically here. And there are many other implications of just thinking through the kinematics right. Again, the visual imagination in overdrive. And uh, this, uh, in my own sort of modeling of these things, uh, what followed from this sort of wonderful insight from 1959 is, 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 is a key to actually modeling these jets and trying to understand what the emitting elements are. Okay, so let's move on now. Uh, I said there are jets there everywhere. I don't want to belabor this, but I just would say it's a very common phenomenon. Even the Crab Nebula shows it. There's a, probably a billion of them on the sky. These are counted by a South African observatory. Here's a protostar, it makes jets. Here's a binary, a, a, a stellar black hole binary. Here's a neutrino source. Um, here's the gravi gravi gravitational radiation, gravitational merging neutron, gravitational radiation merging neutron star, uh, the famous one. Um, they, they, they've all got jets. And so it's something quite generic is responsible for these. Okay, uh, so um, let's go back again to, you know, jet, to, to what might be going on. And now I'm going to get into the, the, the black hole shadow um, of the event horizon uh, and the event horizon telescope observations. And this was a sort of wonderful international uh, enterprise. Um, uh, M87 itself um, was uh, famous um, as uh, amongst astronomers. It was in fact the very first source that was known to uh, have a jet, uh, 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 Heber Kirtless in 1917 was the first person to observe this at the Lick Observatory. And, uh, and, and it is in fact is the, sort of the, the best case to study. It's a bright galaxy in a rich cluster uh, of galaxies. And um, this jet is seen through, from radio wavelength to gamma rays, it varies in a day. This is a six and a half billion solar mass black hole in the middle, which we have to believe is spinning. And the jet is pointed not exactly at us, uh, but nearly at us uh, at an angle of about 17 degrees or so. And um, uh, I want you to draw attention um, to, um, to two features of what's actually, to, to, to a few features of what's going on here. Um, the first is if we look at these observations made by radio astronomers on very different scales, we see the jets expanding from 
scales of uh, about 10 to the 15 centimeters to going way, way outside the galaxy, as you can see in this, in this image here. So they're robust over very large scales. As if you look a bit like a Matryoshka doll, if you take, take them apart, you get the smaller and smaller scales. And if we look at the jets on the very smaller scale, then something that has been made even more graphic by other images that I'm not going to show you here, but are now available, is that the jets that you're looking at are not, are not just sort of cylinders or cannonballs or something. They are edge bright and features. There is a, um, a flow here and we'll come back to that in a moment. And, um, and then uh, if we look at this on, on the smallest scale before we get to the event horizon telescope image, if we look on this very smallest scale, and then if we uh, deproject it, so we take out, we try and look, imagine looking at it from the side rather than sort of in our direction, it will look like that. And again, you can see this very strong edge brightening and you can see that the jet on these scales is actively being collimated. It's not just sort of fired out from some nozzle, it's actually being actively collimated and made more and more jet-like by, whatever, by whatever's going on in the black hole and then all the gas that's flowing around it. So that is, um, uh, that's a very import important observation. Now, the, the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration that made this famous image here, I don't think I have to uh, say any more about it, it's famous and then Reinhardt talked about it a bit. Um, uh, th this was a sort of remarkable collaboration where you had to get uh, idiosyncratic telescopes, idiosyncratic uh, government funding agencies are most impressive all idiosyncratic astronomers all to work together in different places producing all uh all their bits to combine the information they got from their radio telescopes to make this and a series of other images and it's it's been a, a fantastic thing to watch this happening and i'm full of admiration for the people who've done it uh so um not everyone was so impressed though here's a cartoon um, I'll leave that as it is, um, uh, but I'm impressed and, and this is probably the best case we have to observe. There are other things that are being observed. Sajay Star is, comp we have a comparable resolution for the Event Horizon Telescope, but as Ryan Huck can explain to you, the, there are extra difficulties with making those images in that case, which make M87 probably the, the best case that we have to study and we're still learning more about, about it. Now, in terms of explaining what's going on, um, uh, I'm going to give you firstly the orthodox view, and this is the one that the collaboration has largely uh, pursued. And that is basically, as I said, it showed in an earlier slide, um, that we have uh, one of these accretion disks that thickens near the, the black hole. So I said I'd show you this slide again, and what the radio telescopes are looking at is essentially a ring of gas orbiting the black hole, making a jet here in the middle. And uh, it, 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 this, this ring of gas is supported by the pressure of hot protons or ions, and it's weakly magnetized. There are also presence, there have to be, cooler electrons, which emit synchrotron radiation. And um, uh, obviously, when we look at this gas here in this model, the gas is orbiting the black hole and the bright part at the bottom here is essentially that which is coming towards us in an orbiting ring. And so it isn't completely along the line of sight, it's at a finite angle. And the part that's coming most towards us is Doppler shifted and that's why it looks brighter. And uh, the event horizon itself obviously makes a shadow and the rays themselves are strongly deflected in the curved space time. So what, what is done is you make simulations that look something like this, which you never resolve with the telescope. Then you form images um, and you try and explain uh, the data that comes from the radio telescopes in these terms. And this may be, may be the correct basis of a correct explanation. And so it's fair to say that sophisticated modeling can account for the observations. But the view I've taken is somewhat heterodox in this, and in, this is a Penrose symposium, so let, let's go for it. Um, this, this is um, 
Uh, and this is that, and it's really stimulated not just by wanting to be ordinary or different, it's because of three, I think many puzzles, but three important ones. One is a, a sort of naive view of what's going on is that the power in the jet is some is at least a, something like a hundred times the ring power, what you actually observe with the with those radio telescopes. The second is that the gas supply at large radius is a, a, typically about a hundred times what you would need to explain what you're seeing, even the jets. And, and the third is what I've emphasized is the jet is being collimated. So we, uh, with, with my going over goes, I've been thinking very much about an alternative explanation of this that really harks back to Roger's original ideas about black hole spin. And this is that not only does the spinning black hole power the jet, and I think by this time, mo probably most people uh, have come to terms with that. It wasn't true, I would say, five years ago, but I think they probably have come to terms with that now. But it actually does much more. It's responsible, for the black hole rotation is responsible for much more of the, um, of the show. And in particular, all of this gas supplied at large radius is, is driven off uh, by power that derives and is carried out by that torque I mentioned through a disk to large radius and it's all driven off. So very little of the gas that's supplied goes off in a disk and instead it's a magnetized wind. And it's that magnetized wind extending over say 10,000 gravitational radii that is responsible for the collimation of the jet on those sort of length scales. I obviously made more detailed models than this, but this in words is, is where we're at. And so instead of having an accretion disk, you've got a, an ejection disk, another Latin construct, if you like. And, and instead of looking at a ring, a hot iron torus, a ring, what the EHT folks are looking at is something like what you see in a pulsar, it's a magnetosphere, or we would say an ergomagnetosphere, an ergomagnetosphere, rotating magnetic field lines dominating the energy density, and in which you've got the emission of the radio waves that are seen by the radio astronomers. So that's the sort of general story there, and this obviously has implications for many other sources, including those which uh, Reinhardt's wonderful gravi gravity setup is observing not just in the galactic center, but in all the other sources it's looking at. So this, this picture has, a, has, has, diff, dip, has implications um, for the observations of these sources. And I think, I think it's, it's very nice and it's testable. And as I emphasize, there's a big current flow here. There'll be current in this cartoon going down the jet and coming out in the disk. So it's a big electrical circuit. But when you look, I, I remember I said that the, um, uh, uh, the, 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 the jets were, were, limb, were brightened on the edges, now strongly believe, and there's good reasons for this, I think, that what you're looking at is dissipation associated with the return current. There's a jet that comes down the jet like this, and then a return current that goes out like that. And it's this return current rather than the fluid mechanic effect that is giving you the dissipation, giving you the radio emission that's observed in those images. Let me quickly move on because I'm Getting, getting the end of my 45 minutes. Um, I'm, I emphasized that the, um, in order to make a model of any of these sources, uh, then you have to allow for the deflection of light by uh, the gravity, the space time, essentially the gravity associated with the black hole. And this is the phenomenon generally called gravitational lensing. Einstein thought about it. Um, here's a sort of example of gravitational lensing by a galaxy. And so galaxies have weak gravitational fields, but they can make beautiful gravitational lenses. You see here, black holes can do the same, but they're strong, um, make uh, strong um, gravitational, uh, but they have strong gravitational fields. And so it gets more interesting from a sort of theoretical point of view. Point of view if you like, now I worked on this sort of the weak gravitational lensing for cosmology and so on for many years. And one of the things that was a big influence on me, and I would pay true to this here, is a paper, is, it was a sort of a couple of throwaway lines of equations in a paper in a conference proceedings that Roger wrote. It's not one of his famous ones. It's somewhat derivative of the singularity theorems that he 
you know, uh, right, he mentioned he's rightly recognized for, but actually he completely jump started my research on the, on understanding these, these black holes in terms of optical caustics or catastrophes and so on. And this has just come up rather nicely recently uh, because I've been part of a paper that my, that has been led and sort of largely, I think the work has been largely is most the majority of the work has actually been done by my colleague Dan Wilkins, um, and this has um, received a certain amount of uh, attention recently. And basically, it's an X-ray version of this using a source called OneZwicky One, and it's kind of nice that it's OneZwicky One because Zwicky was a famous uh, astronomer who was one of the godfathers and pioneers of gravitational lenses. He was one of the first people to say, look, gravitational lenses ought to be there, look for them. And he was right, of course. Uh, but this is one from one of his catalogs, this X-ray source. Now with X-ray astronomy, we don't do direct imaging, but what we can do is instead of looking at X and Y on the sky, we can look at the energy of the X-ray photons and the time they arrive. And that's a two dimensional plot too. And, um, and basically what you're looking at is a source of X-rays that's shining down on a disc in the simple-minded description. And then it is uh, reflected from that disc as a, as a line photon, which means it has a, a, a velocity, it has a Doppler shift, and then it's observed by a distant observer. And using this device, you're actually looking at at uh, 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 the back of, from behind the black hole. So you're looking behind the black hole, the gravitational lensing is that strong. And the, the, the point that I'd like to make is that the, um, uh, you see caustic structures here, just like you do in the sort of more traditional gravitational lenses. And again, this, you know, this, you know, my own personal path down this road, if you like, was strongly, uh, uh, influenced by by this conference proceedings that Roger wrote a long time ago, and um, and uh, and it, of course it'd be lovely to do this sort of thing for M eighty seven, and uh, uh, that's a, a goal for the future. But it's it's a very exciting time. Uh, now, I just uh, sort of uh, a, a, a final um, thing, and that is the. Um, uh, in looking at the Event Horizon Telescope, not only are you looking at the intensity of the light, you're also looking at the linear and the circular polarization. And this is telling you about the magnetic field. Um, and, uh, and you should be able to tell by analyzing this, and these, these, these maps have been published recently by the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration. These lines here are telling you the direction of the magnetic field. And, uh, it's not entirely clear what the interpretation of this is, but we should be able to tell whether or not uh, the, um, the, Im the images that one is seeing are those of a hot gas or a magnetosphere. And I'd just like to uh, again thank Roger because he wrote a paper in 1970 with Walker when he introduced a tensor which can be used for doing trace relating the polarization that's emitted here to what's seen by the radio telescope without having to integrate the long line of sight. And this is what we all use nowadays in trying to make models of this particular source in M87. And there's a lot that we will learn from this. I won't, I won't belabor that point. I just want to get now to my sort of final concluding slide, if I can. I think I'm just on the 45 minutes. Um, and that is to go off on, a, on another tan completely different tangent and this is into what I would call recreational cosmology. You're going to hear from some of the professionals um, on the last day. And, um, and I, I have sort of re reason for doing this. Um, the, one of the biggest accomplishments of many in modern cosmology has been to make a map of the temperature of the sky showing the tiny fluctuations in the microwave background, 10 parts per million and so on. And this is shown in this map here from the Planck satellite up here. And uh, the normal way of looking at this is to um, do a spherical harmonic analysis, essentially, uh, and look at the statistics of those spherical harmonics. And on this basis, the standard model of cosmology has been derived. And just like the standard model of particle physics, although there are tensions that are widely advertised, 
I personally see no strong evidence that insofar as it goes, that there's anything wrong with it. Of course, as Roger just said, there's a, um, uh, there's a lot further it can go. And, and on, that, on those questions, it, th this map must be silent. But um, if you imagine looking at this in a very different way and analyzing this data in a different way, and just imagine looking at the sky with artificially degrading the, resol the angular resolution of this map, and then just sort of building up to the full resolution that you have. Then you will see a sequence, uh, I did have a movie, but there wasn't time for it, that, um, that shows um, if you draw the contours of the temperature, sorry, if you show, do the contours of the temperature, then the sort of seas that pass through saddle points can be classified in, with a nod to classical geometry of lemnosets and limosons and so on. And the nesting of these uh, can be converted into a, a tree, another of Roger's great interest is in combinatorics and so on, and it can be converted to a tree. And the statistics of that tree, I think, but I'm not sure, contains complementary information that may add something to the standard and well-developed well, well uh, uh, approach using spherical harmonics. And so my, my question, and you can also do this sort of thing with curvature and polarization in 3D and so on. So there's, you know, there's, more, there's more, a bit, bit more to this, but it may be it's all well known and well known not to be terribly interesting. So my question for me to Ro Roger Penrose is, is this sort of complementary approach something he's ever seen before? Um, is, it well, is, it, is it well studied or is it, is it useful or useless? Um, but let me just finish with um, a, a parting shot and just say very happy birthday next week, Roger. Congratulations on achieving your first quadrant. <laughs> Thank you very much, yes. No, that's very wonderful talk. Thank you. I must go and remind myself what that paper with Walker was saying. But <laughs> I have a vague memory of it. Well, we've all studied it, studied it carefully and it's great. <laughs> No, no, I, I'm really interested in that. I'd like to see that. Yeah, no, and, and the whole thing with these jets and everything, I think it's fantastic. And uh, I mean, obviously, with such an important observational fact, too, that uh, really to understand the, the mechanism behind that, I think it's amazing. So thank you very much for a wonderful talk. Can I move over to Stuart, perhaps, for questions? Yeah. Uh, Roger, can you, uh, we can't see you. Can you, oh. on the lower part of your screen, uh, you want to, uh, uh, well, let me just stop sharing. Uh, well, here's kind of a, uh, somebody wants to know what, which book has the diagram of covariant differentiation? <laughs> um, could, that, what, could that be the road, the road to reality? To reality. It is the road to reality. Yeah. <laughs> it may yeah. be others, but, uh. It's only about a thousand pages. Here it is. <laughs> yes, no, it's a fat book, but there are lots of pictures in it, yes. No, I, I drew the pictures, apart from one or two, which were, uh, yeah, pretty well all of them, yes. What is Roger Penrose's opinion on recreational cosmology? <laughs> Maybe I, Reinhardt I, has an opinion too. I feel here, here, Reinhardt's view. I wasn't quite sure I understood it. So, <laughs> recreation. I wasn't quite sure. I got quite got the point of what it was. I'm sorry about that. It's essentially just nesting the iso, treating the isotherms as contours oh, on the I sphere, see. and then ah. puncturing it. And then just consider those contours that pass through a saddle, you know, in the most elementary way. Oh, I see what you mean, yes. And considering the nesting of the contours and the. Yes. It's not um, something I've ever indulged in, so I would let, move over to other people, I think. Yes, I don't know. Here's a question. Uh, uh, what do you think of, uh, I don't know this. Uh, Nima Arkady Hamid's idea of a recent uh, that that space time is doomed and that space time is most probably not fundamental. And there's another thing which is more fundamental from which space time emerges. Well, I think uh, probably my view is different from his. I mean, a lot of what he does is based on the ADS CFT thing, 
which uh, I don't follow. Um, but I, Twister theory is certainly saying that space time is secondary. I mean, that's, I mean, I certainly rushed through it much too quickly because it wasn't central to the talk today. But I did have a picture showing how in Twister theory, the points in, in the Twister space, the, the points are secondary because they're spheres. I mean, you have these Riemann spheres, which, which actually represent space-time points. But the, the points are more like light rays. I mean, the, the, more, the fundamental things, put it like that, are more like light rays. But the twisters are not quite light rays. They've got a twist to them, as you might expect. So think of a photon which has an angular momentum. So that's a bit more like it. But it's, an, it's not a picture which extends fully as things stand to a general relativity view. It works in special relativity, but if you want to go to general relativity, there are issues which are still not quite resolved. I mean, uh, it gets very complicated. So to say there's something more fundamental than points is certainly I'm sympathetic with, but in the sort of point of view that, I don't know about his point of view, but the point of view I adopt, it's more like subalgebras in an algebra. <laughs> So you have this algebra and there are certain types of subalgebras which can consider points. So the points are secondary objects. And so if you want to explain the collapse of the wave function, which is very peculiar because it, things seem to jump, um, you might have a better understanding of that if the things which jump are not really the fundamental things and they're secondary and the, the things which you think are points can become something else suddenly. And so you certainly get a feature like that, which looks possibly might explain something like the collapse of the wave function. But I would hate to say that it's an answer to that question. Okay, anybody else have a... Well, actually I had a question for uh, Roger about Roger Blanford about that, uh, about the uh, musical spheres. What was, uh, you wanna elaborate on that? Because uh, you have all these vibrations and is something oh. making it physical? Uh, well, uh, oh, uh, music of the sphere is just an, uh, it's just a joke. It's just an allusion to uh, 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 um, uh, and so on. Um, and um, that's not serious. I, I mean, it, it is serious in the sense that the way that one thinks about this is to make a harmonic analysis of the temp initially the temperature fluctuations on the sky. And so in much the same way in doing standard quantum mechanics, you uh, use what are called spherical harmonics, which are like a spherical version of a Fourier transform. Um, you use those for saying what the wave function looks like. You can do the same thing for in cosmology. And in particular, you can do it for the, temper the, the temperature variation across the sky, which is what uh, radio telescopes like Planck actually see. Okay, here's another question for everybody, I think. In your opinion, could attempting to formulate a nonlinear theory of quantum mechanics be worth pursuing? I think Roger's already done that. Uh, <laughs> done this I'll second right. his view, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, you could say the linearity of quantum mechanics is the culprit, because if you have a superposition, then that superposition persists forever. And so you don't get a collapse of the wave function. So you might say, but any theory in which the collapse of the wave function or the objective reduction of the state, if you like, is a, is a physical process, it has to be nonlinear in the sense that the linearity of the Schrodinger equation, if you like, you could call the culprit. You know, the cat is dead and the cat is alive and they just, <laughs> they just exist and coexist with each other. But that's not what you see. You see either a dead cat or a live cat. So this breaks linearity in a sense. But I think it's something much more subtle than that because people do introduce nonlinear terms. That's been a, uh, an activity for many years. And right. it doesn't, doesn't sort of, straight that I don't think can be the answer. It's the problem. So that's really a question for tomorrow an objective reduction. Um, here's a question for Friday. <laughs> Compare your <laughs> Compare your CCC with Andy Elbrecht and Joe Magalu's cosmology using lambda and a varying speed of light, please. Do you know that one? 
I can't imagine that it's anything similar. <laughs> I don't know what the other theory is, so it's hard for me to comment. But there's no varying speed of light in it, no. In CCC, there's not. No, so you're, you're very fundamentally con consistent with that, that respect, that aspect of general relativity. You've got a space time and you've got the speed of light, and that's very well defined. I mean, it's not, we're not looking at quantum effects. Even, even at the Big Bang, you see, that's what's rather remarkable about the CCC picture, although you would say quantum gravity must be coming in when the curvatures get very, very high, and then you, you sort of don't have a classical picture. But you get away with it because you can cross over from one side to the other when, when you like, and you can do it just late enough this is a calculation due to Christoph Meisner. That you can extend the classical description so that you don't have to worry about quantum gravity, if you like, in CCC. I mean, whether that's right or not depends more discussion, but it's, it's fortunate that you don't get entangled with that issue. Um, well, this is an easy one for Roger, I think. Uh, are you familiar with versions of quantum mechanics that alternate? that eliminate the observer. One has been published by Faye Dalker. Your objective reduction explains the observer. So it's not really eliminate, it's explaining the observer. <laughs> it, That's a subtle question. I mean, there are lots of attempts. And Faye Dalker certainly is one of the people who's looked at ideas of, of making the state reduction an objective process. So that at that level, See, if you don't talk about the consciousness side of what I've been doing, we're very much trying to do the same sort of thing in finding a phys physically objective theory which incorporates the collapse of the wave function or the reduction of the quantum state. It's just a secondary issue that I'm leaping into this issue of trying to address consciousness. It's the other side of a, of a, of a rock, if you like, looking at the um, question of whether Consciousness itself can be a phenomenon which comes about by virtue of the collapse of the wave function, which is regarded as an objective phenomenon. So, it's, so both of us were saying, look, the reduction of the state or the collapse of the wave function is an objective phenomenon taking place in nature independently of when, uh, whether there are ob observers around looking at it. Right. Here's a related question. A lot of these come around to consciousness. Uh, uh, but um, uh, what do you think about Don Hoffman's theory of consciousness based on the assumption that not space time, but that consciousness made of conscious agents is, is the only thing to be considered fundamental? You probably wouldn't agree with that. Anyway. It's not my view, no. <laughs> okay. Uh, Don's been to our conference. He has this interface theory and, and I, I told him the interface is the collapse, but that's, that's another question. Um, uh, uh, is neurobiological consciousness fundamental or cosmic consciousness? I, I, I don't see a difference actually. Let's just, uh, I'm not sure I understand the question. Yeah. No, me neither. Um, okay. Um, uh, uh, I'm going to skip over the rest of these. Uh, Reinhardt or Roger, do you have any questions for Roger or vice versa? Any questions among the three of you regarding your excellent talks? Well, uh, let, let me let me chime in first. Um, Reinhardt, you, you quite properly emphasize the galactic center uh, in your in your talk. Could you just in words say, which of the many candidates excites you the most about observations of other sources that you have made with your setup at, at the VLT? Uh, well, okay, so to the audience, uh, perhaps as an explanation, this interferometry business uh, is something the radio astronomers uh, would, would think trivial, uh, would say, well, we've been doing this since uh, 70 years. Uh, and inter interesting, of course, as you know, I mean, Michelson tried it in the 1930s in the optical. And once he passed away, nobody could get it going anymore. 
until Charlie Towns came and he tried it. But, and, and if, if, you, if you read in Towns' uh, write-ups, I mean, he always said that in the end, what he wanted to do is look at the galactic center within the formatory because he felt that's, that's exactly how. Now, between what Towns did and what we have done now, is a factor of a million in, in, in complexity, uh, sensitivity and so forth. And that breakthrough really came about by, as I described by technology. Now, having done this once, as we've did, done, now the, the sky is the limit, I would say. We are we're currently expanding the uh, sensitivity by another factor of a hundred. We, uh, we, we are beginning to be able to uh, track our fringes on a, on a distant object, not just the object itself. So with that comes in cosmology and it's beginning already. We, with that comes in binary black holes and the last parsec uh, problem. With that comes in exoplanets. I mean, the interesting thing is uh, exoplanets, of course, we all want to know uh, uh, what chemistry is in their atmospheres and could it be that there are substances there which, which require life. I mean, that's, that's one of the big questions of the future. Just to get there is very difficult because you have to work in the presence of that incredibly brighter star, central star. Now the interferometer doesn't see the star. Uh, and so that's, uh, that's how we, so uh, we, are, we are seeing a transition in optical astronomy where interferometry is, is being used for a whole variety of new applications. Can I ask Reinhardt a question? Sure. Um, is there any chance of, say, the Andromeda galaxy looking at the black hole there? And, and... It's in the north, Roger. Oh. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately. <laughs> Unfortunately. Uh, we can send a few graduate students up and move it a little. And... <laughs> <laughs> I see. Well, the other galaxy. Uh, yeah, no, I think that will become possible with the new tech, new possibilities. Uh, whether we see individual stars, I'm a little skeptical. The next big experiment, which we would or one should try, uh, is is intermediate mass black holes in globular clusters, mm. and there gravity would would do would do extremely well. The reason we can't do it right now is because the field of view of the current instrument is too narrow. Since you don't actually know what a black hole is to that accuracy in a, in a global cluster, you have to map around. And so that, that, that requires a new, a new version of the instrument. But that's certainly something when we want to know how the big black holes evolved and, and most people feel there could, could very well be that they started as intermediate mass, mass black holes in star clusters. And so that's, we'd like to see one of those. Right? What's the situation with globular clusters? Is there any... The evidence right now is, uh, I would say, marginally indecisive. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <it's>... <laughs> yeah you, will, you will feed some people, find some people who, who feel they have some evidence, and then on the same, on the same globular cluster that you find somebody else was it absolutely not. So <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, that's a clear answer, anyway. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you didn't. You okay. didn't say Reinhardt the things that you've already. You talked about the future, but you already looked at more sources of the, many more sources than the Galactic Center. Yes. What? Yes. What? Which, which are those? Th what? What? What would you say are the big, big highlights of what you've learned from that imaging? Well, I think the fact that we can measure black hole masses through broadline region uh, uh, spectroscopy, Im imaging spectroscopy, it was was highly satisfactory, I must say, because again, mm -hmm. it's the same kind of a deal. You do spectroscopy and imaging together, and then you can do physics. That's just fantastic. I'm afraid it's the same kind of an idea, V squared R over G in some form. Mm, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> here's a, here's a, maybe the last question uh, from, uh, Sounds like a student. Do you have any advice for physics PhD students on research you think is worth pursuing? Other than everything you've talked about, all three of you. It's such an open question. I'd hate to attempt to answer that one. <laughs> depends on your own interests. It depends on 
Um, I mean, people differ very much from the sorts of things they like to look at. Do what you want to look at, I would say. I think that's an important one. Yeah. If something intrigues you, follow it up. Um, can, can, uh, can I support and add to that? Um, I think perform the perform the stress test and say you try and try something, try lots of different things, and say, as Roger talked about, you know, does this interest me? Does this capture my imagination? Does this something I want to work on? You can find out by actually just trying it for a, for a while and see if it really grabs you. But then the other thing is, I think, in terms of context, and uh, uh, is to look forward, not backwards. Don't don't pay too much attention to the fields that have just had a, a you know scientific research is a little cyclical and don't pay so much attention to the fields that have just had an, a long growth spurt and are now plateauing out look for the ones that have been dormant but for various reasons including experiments that are incipient or observations that are incipient oh are just waiting to take off and that, and that might be a, a, a good, a bit of a second guide, if you like. Absolutely, I second that, Roger. I mean, Towns, who was good at these kind of things, would always say, well, you know, I would always go ahead and, and, and do something new, which interested me. And then when I got something done and really the field got going and lots of people entered the field, that was the time to do, stop it and go, go next to the next uh, challenge. I mean, it's the right. same as. I was going to say quantum biology is going to be the next one. My totally biased opinion. <laughs> well, anything else? This has been a. a uh, uh, I'm looking at the last few questions here. Um, I think uh, I think we'll let them go. And uh, this has been a wonderful session. I want to thank all three of you. Um, and uh, we had a few glitches we'll try to take care of tomorrow. Uh, Roger Blanford, you're going to be chairing the session tomorrow. So uh, uh, you'll ch uh, we'll be checking in with you a little bit before the session starts. And uh, uh, Roger too, and Reinhardt, I hope you'll be there too. So uh, uh, if you have any other uh, closing comments, if not, uh, uh, maybe we'll, we'll call it a session and reconvene tomorrow. Okay, well, thank you everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And happy birthday, Roger, the beginning of the celebration. The Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences has today decided to award the 2020 Nobel Prize in Physics with one half to Roger Penrose for the discovery that black hole formation is a robust prediction of the general theory of relativity. <laughs>